Welcome everyone to the best guide and course on how to find small cap crypto gems. This course will cover everything that you need to know to find small cap crypto projects. From on-chain analysis, research, to setting up a wallet and using a decentralized exchange like Uniswap, to actually finally being able to buy a small cap crypto gem before it's even listed on a centralized exchange, this course has you covered. Now, I got into crypto a few years ago and when I was first starting out, I was only using Coinbase. I was buying into projects after they were, of course, listed on Coinbase, but I was also buying them when they were already rallying. And I never realized that in order to truly make substantial gains in crypto, you need to be early and you preferably need to already buy it before it's listed on prominent exchanges. So yeah, Bitcoin will probably go up, sure. But let's be honest, is it really going to 10x from here? Is it going to 50x? I mean, a 2x from Bitcoin's current price would bring the price of Bitcoin to around $100,000 per coin right now, which don't get me wrong, that would be a nice gain, but the true gains are from small crypto projects. Also, when I first started out, I didn't know how to conduct my own research, so I would just follow that of others. And this is where you will fail, and here's why. You'll often see influencers promote a coin or a project after the project already rallies and or the individual has a vested interest, where it was because they are actually vested in the project, aka they bought into the project via a pre-sale and it's of course in their interest for the price to go up, or they of course own some of the project and want the project to go up, or they are being paid by the project to promote it, which is okay if they disclose it. Oftentimes they don't, or it could be marketing companies hired by the project to have bots promote their shitty project on socials. All this is to say, you get dumped on by the time that you find out about it. You buy high, and then when the price tanks, you sell low, all because you are manipulated. This is what happened to me. Over the past years, I've developed a few good systems in place to find projects early do due diligence and risk assessment, and find projects with potential before they're listed on exchanges. This is what I'm going to be teaching you in this course. This ultimately is a message to my younger self, what I wish I would have watched before really getting started with finding smaller cap crypto projects. So first things first, who am I? My name is Trevor. I'm originally from Maryland in the US, and it's the small state that no one knows anything about. Three years ago, I was really into trading stocks, and I happened to be a part of the GME hype with Wall Street Bets. GME, or GameStop, happened to be one of the best investments that I ever made at the time, turning my $10 per share into close to $80 per share. Around this time in 2021, Ethereum really started taking off, and it really piqued my interest. So I started learning about crypto, stuff like what is Bitcoin, what is Ethereum, and I fell in love with it, to be honest. I liked stocks, but it felt very boomer, if that makes sense. And the idea of technology and finance seemed really cool and refreshing to me. And just a side note, I'm still into stocks now, but crypto is my largest holding. So I started investing into crypto like Bitcoin, ETH, Polkadot, Litecoin, all the classics. I remember the gains were way better than what I ever had in the stock market. And I love that the market was 24 seven and that there wasn't a pattern day trader rule. For those of you who don't know, in the US, if your account value is below $25,000 in a broker account, there's a rule that prevents you from trading more than a few times within a specific window of time. I consistently would break that rule and be banned from brokers because I never held more than $25,000 in my account. So I love that with crypto. I didn't feel discriminated against for wanting to make unlimited trades for them, or like I had a bedtime to trade because the traditional market would close at 4 p.m. Daddy Powell putting the Americans to sleep, or Janet Yellen having hearsay over what I do with my money. All that is to say, I got obsessed with crypto, and I felt like I had a calling to it. At the time, I was actually working in construction, and I really hated my life, to be honest. I was overweight, I had student loans, I didn't feel passionate with anything until I discovered crypto. And at the time, I was on a hamster wheel, uh, a rat stuck in the cage, if you will. Waking up at 4 a.m. to work all day in D.C., and then be home around 6 p.m., it absolutely sucked. I decided I was going to do anything to hop off the hamster wheel. So I paid off all my student loans, living at my dad's house, and I saved up $2,000 and bought a one-way flight to Poland. 
During all this, I was applying to crypto jobs because they all happened to be remote. They didn't care where you lived and it was something I was really passionate about. My only skill set at that time was video editing. And so I was applying to companies as a video editor. One day I was looking at all the different tickers on CMC and I saw they had a career section. So I clicked on that and saw that there was a YouTube position open for CMC's YouTube channel. I immediately applied and said I would work for free for them if needed and I would do anything to show how dedicated I would be. To my surprise, they emailed me back and said they would be interested in me working for them. So I came up with a few video ideas and produced around four to five videos for free for them to see if they liked my style. They liked my hustle and drive and they brought me onto their team and I started editing videos for them. Then eventually they asked me to record videos for them as a spokesperson and the rest is history. I've been here for a while and observed a lot of things in this industry. I've also been curating the best strategies to find projects early and this course is one to show you how to do just that. None of this is financial advice. Crypto is risky. Don't follow anything I do. This is all entertainment. None of this, of course, is advice. And if at any point here you find value, make sure to go to my school group where you'll see everything from on-chain analysis, small cap crypto projects, and a lot more. You can join via the top link in the description below. Okay, let's go. Welcome to module 1.1. So before we get started with, you know, all of the analysis, on-chain analysis, setting up a wallet, you know, finding small gems and all the things that come with that, you know, let's start with the basics, right? I think in order to get to the more advanced stage, we should at least start with the just overlook view of what is blockchain, what is Bitcoin, like how does this stuff work? What What is all this stuff? Just the broad overview. And I think if also if you're intermediate in the space, you've been around for a while, it's also good to, of course, refresh your knowledge and just refresh things, right? So I think it would probably benefit you as well. So let's start with some of the basics. And I wanted to break this down and just a super like basic, easy, you know, to understand type of, you know, situation here. First things first. So let's talk about blockchain technology, right? What is it? How does it work? And why is it important? We're going to start with a notebook. Now, I don't have an actual notebook on me, but I do have an iPad with a pencil so I can pretend here. So imagine a notebook that many people have a copy of, right? Whenever someone wants to write something new in it, like a transaction of money, everyone must agree on it. This notebook is super special because once something is written, it can't be erased or changed by one person. To change something, everyone with a notebook would need to agree to erase and rewrite from that point forward. So this basically is what blockchain is, a digital notebook for transactions that's shared across many computers. So let's talk about transaction verification. When someone wants to make a transaction, like sending money, right? This action is proposed to the network of computers. Then there's also block creation. So once a transaction is verified as legitimate, it's grouped with other transactions in the block. And you can actually see that right here with transactions that are happening right now with Bitcoin. Then there's also consensus mechanisms. So before adding this block to the notebook, there's a kind of puzzle solving contest think proof of work or a voting system like proof of stake that helps ensure that everyone else agrees that it's valid. So this process also keeps the network secure from bad actors. So why is any of this important in the first place? Blockchain lets digital currencies like Bitcoin operate without a central boss, like a bank controlling everything. This means there is transparency. So since the notebook is shared, everyone can see the transactions. There's also security. So it's very hard for someone to cheat or hack the system because of the consensus needed to make changes. And then there is also immutability. So once something is written in the notebook, it's pretty much there forever. And you can't just go back and erase something without everyone else knowing and also agreeing. So blockchain is like a secure shared digital notebook that makes sure that transactions are transparent, secure, and also permanent. Now, Let's get into the next. So first of all, understanding cryptocurrencies. What are they? You know, first one and just the variety. So you can think of cryptocurrencies like digital money that you can't touch, but you can use online. They're super secure because they use special codes like cryptography, and they also run on that shared digital notebook system called the blockchain. So Bitcoin was the first of its kind, and it was also made by someone or a group of people we don't really know called Satoshi Nakamoto. The cool thing about Bitcoin is that it lets people send money to each other directly without needing a bank or any middleman. 
there's obviously so many different ones, right? There's 2.2 plus million listed on CMC. And, you know, after Bitcoin, a ton of other ones popped up like, you know, Ethereum, which obviously is similar to Bitcoin, but it can do other things like handle contracts that automatically do certain things when conditions are when specific conditions are met. And then there's stable coins. So, you know, these obviously don't go up or down in value, or at least they shouldn't wink, wink. Um, but, you know, they have a lot of different benefits within the ecosystem. So basically, in short, cryptocurrencies are digital money. Bitcoin was the first one, and now there are many others with all sorts of extra bells and whistles and things like that. So in short, think of cryptocurrencies as digital assets, right? Not all of them are digital money that you're sending or trying to use to pay for a transaction for something because not all of these are meant for that or and or good at that. But think of them more as digital assets. Now, how do transactions work, right? Let's talk about making transactions, transaction fees, and also just decentralization in general. So sending and receiving. Imagine you want to send some digital money, like cryptocurrency, to a friend. You'd send it to their digital wallet address, kind of like emailing money, but super secure. Then there's security keys. So to keep things safe, you have a secret key, like a super complicated password that you never share, and a public one that you do share. This combo makes sure that only you can send your money. Now, when it comes to checking the transaction, people called miners or validators look at the transaction to make sure that it's legit. And they're like digital referees basically watching. So why pay transaction fees then? Paying for work, that's what you're doing. Those referees or miners or validators get a small fee for their trouble. So this fee can actually change just based on how busy the network is and also how complex the transaction is. So think of it as a tip for fast service, right? And then why decentralization? Well, freedom and safety. Since there's no big boss like a bank controlling everything, more people can join in even if they don't have bank accounts. And it's harder for anyone to block or mess with transactions and you're in charge of your own digital money stash. Now let's talk about the bigger picture, right? Bitcoin right now is more so seen as digital gold and it's more so as a way to save money that won't lose its value over time. And it's like a online treasure chest, right? I think more so people view Bitcoin as that now. But there's obviously other cryptocurrencies that do other different cool things. For example, some make it easier to lend or borrow money without a bank. So think DeFi. Others run apps that don't have a single company controlling them. So think dApps. But obviously, there's just a ton of growing pains in the space still. I mean, people are still figuring out how to, you know, for example, one, one, one of the biggest things is just how to have, you know, how to handle a ton of transactions. That's been a big problem for a lot of different cryptocurrencies. And for example, here you can actually see Bitcoin, which has a bunch of transactions that are coming in right here, but these are all just unconfirmed. So it takes a while for these to actually get confirmed now because a lot more people are using the network. And then the next thing obviously is rules and regulations. So governments are still deciding the best ways to handle cryptocurrencies, which as of right now can make things a bit uncertain. And then people are currently complaining about, you know, some being energy hungry and using a lot of electricity, which could hurt the environment. But that's a whole nother talk for another day. And the biggest point for all of them that they're usually trying to hit is security, decentralization and speed. So if you can hit all three, that is a golden zone, the golden ticket. So you know how late at night you and your girlfriend both tell yourself that size doesn't matter? Well, I hate to break it to you. But you're both lying to yourself because size does matter. Today, we're going to be talking about market cap, why the size of it is so important. Welcome to module 1.2. Let's get into it. What is market cap? Market cap is this number here on CoinMarketCap, which is a data aggregator, which shows the prices of different coins, projects, etc. And the market cap is the total amount, the total value worth of all of the coins that have been issued and or mined and are currently out into supply. Now there's also FDB, which is fully diluted market cap and fully diluted valuation, but we'll talk about that in a minute because it's a little bit different. Now also it could be the value of the total tokens that are also out into supply. For example, Tether is a token on Ethereum. Bitcoin is a coin, Ethereum is a coin. These are separate blockchains and a token lives on to a blockchain. So for example, with Tether, it is a ERC-20 asset and it lives onto the Ethereum blockchain. Now, when it comes to the market cap, 
this is really important to note. So for example, right now, it's actually really easy for me to make this because the market cap of Bitcoin right now is at a flat $1 trillion, which is really good for me. Now, when it comes to it, how do you get that? In order to get, you, you can change these calculations around a little bit. If you wanted to find the current supply, you would divide the market cap by the price. And that's how you get the supply. If you wanted to find the market cap, all you have to do is multiply the price of that asset and you multiply it by the current supply. And that's how you get the market cap. Now the fully diluted market cap is also important to note and we'll go over reasons why in a little bit here, but the fully diluted market cap, in order to get this number, this would be the current price point times the maximum supply of coins that will ever come out into circulation. So this is important to note and we'll go over it and as to why this is important in just a minute here. Now, I started off this video telling you guys that, you know, you're being lied to by your girlfriend telling you that size doesn't matter, but it does. And also you're being lied to from crypto influencers and people on social media saying, you know, this project is going to 50 X and you know, this is why I'm bullish on this. Let's take a look at chart patterns and all this stuff. And you know, for the most part, it's bullshit. So, you know, oftentimes I hear XRP, okay, an XRP army, which is absolutely insane, probably going to slaughter me for even saying this. But I often hear that XRP is going to 50 X. And it's like, really? Do you really think? Do you really think XRP is going to 50 X? How would we get that? Well, we would times the current price point times 50. So that would bring the price then to $27. Now, which market cap would it have to be at in order to hit that of, for example, $27. Now I want to show you guys this really cool resource and tool. It's called the coin perspective. I'll leave a link of course, in the description below for you guys. And I love it. And I'll be going over a lot of it in this course, but here I'm just going to type in XRP. And then from here, Let's just say that we wanted to have this target price point of $27 per XRP. Okay, so that would be a 50X, right? So we would input the target price point of $27. That would make the market cap $1.5 trillion. Then that would bring the potential price to $27 or an upside then of around 50X. This is super important to note because it would take a $1.5 trillion market cap when, like I said previously, the market cap as of Bitcoin right now is that of 1 trillion. So, you know, when it comes to it, obviously Bitcoin is king and, you know, no one, you know, maybe Ethereum one day and maybe in my lifetime, I don't know, is going to surpass Bitcoin. But as of right now, you know, Bitcoin is obviously king with, you know, around 50% dominance in the market cap when it comes to the market cap, right? And you can actually see that ranked right here, the dominance. So Bitcoin is at 51.3% of the entire market. So a big piece of the pie, right? Now, when it comes to it, you can't just give out a number like, you know, this project is going to 50 X or this or that. And I know a lot of, for example, crypto influencers lie to people to basically just get clicks and stuff like that. But it's, if you're going to take it for yourself and do your own due diligence and, you know, do your own research, you need to really take this into account and just do the math yourself, which is pretty simple to do and just straightforward. And honestly, I actually suck at math and it's pretty easy and straightforward for me. So if I can do it, then you can definitely do it now. So that would be a $1.5 trillion market cap at the current circulating supply as well. Now, another thing with XRP is that a billion XRP get unlocked. I believe it's once a month or so. And you'll see here, XRP circulating supply is only around 50% of its 100 billion tokens. Now let's take a look at that. So here you'll see the circulating supply of XRP right now. And you'll see that 54% of that is actually circulating. So what does this mean? This means that there are 54 billion XRP currently right now out and circulating and that are tradable on the open market. And then there, the total will be a hundred billion. Okay. So, you know, close, close to really 46 billion XRP is going to be emitted into supply. 
This is another thing to note because there's obviously buyers and sellers when it comes to the current price point, but if there's something like inflation and more tokens or coins being emitted into the supply, that will dilute the price point and lower it. And here I'll show you guys how that works. So currently XRP has a market cap of 29.6 billion, which is fairly large. And one XRP is worth 54 cents. Let's just hypothetically say if all of the coins were actually out and circulating in the supply of the 100 billion, that would make the current price of one XRP at the current market cap of 29.6 billion to be worth 30 cents. So down quite a bit from 54 cents. So the more tokens or coins that enter the supply will basically dilute the price point of that project. And this is really important to note. So then let's just hypothetically go back to this 50 X. All right. You're thinking that it's going to go to $27. You're getting hyped, right? Let's just put that in here. Our target price point, let's just hypothetically say was $27. That would bring the market cap to $2.7 trillion. Then it would be $27 or an upside of 50 X. Okay. So this is why you really have to set realistic expectations. And I know, you know, a lot of crypto influencers and, you know, people you see on social media are going to over exaggerate for clicks, but you yourself have to just get down to the basics of math when it comes to this, because a 2.7 trillion dollar, you know, market cap for this project is probably not likely to really happen, right? Considering that Bitcoin's right now is at 1 trillion and then just the total global market cap right now of all the projects is 1.96 trillion. So just, you know, close to, let's just hypothetically say 2 trillion here. So, and this is just saying that this project, just XRP alone, would have 2.7 trillion. So the math doesn't add up here. So it's it's likely not going to happen. This is important to note and this is why you have to set expectations accordingly. Now, another project that I want to talk about is Bonfida. Okay, Bonfida is basically the ENS of Solana. So if you don't know what ENS is, Ethereum name service or ENS is a project that's working on Ethereum and how it works is basically for your public address, you can set that to a custom domain at dot ETH. So for example, you can have, you know, Trevor dot ETH and here you can send funds to it. For example, if you're sending funds from one address to another, you can send it to Trevor dot ETH if you have that domain, for example. So you buy domains and from there you can use that as your public address. Now, they're also building a couple of different things on Ethereum as well in general. But anyways, that's besides the point. Vitalik Buterin said it's pretty important. So Bonfida is basically the same project. The ticker symbol is also FIDA. And it's basically the equivalent version, but on Solana. Now, that's all besides the point because I just want to show you this project. So currently, it has a market cap of $38 million, currently ranked at 635. This number is ranked out of the 8, 000, over 8,000 uh, active cryptocurrencies that are listed and ranked on CMC. Now, it has a market cap of $38 million. And when it comes to the circulating supply, there are 118 that are circulating. And it says here that the total supply will be 991 million. Now, let's take a look at a couple of different things. So the previous all-time high, when it comes to price, was at $10.87. The all-time high market cap, which if you just toggle on the market cap view here on CMC, you can see that the all-time high market cap was at 487 million. And again, it was over $10 for that price point then. So this was also back on November 4th of 2021. So 487 million. So let's just input a couple of variables here. So for example, the ticker is FIDA. And let's just say if it had that market capitalization of 487 million of that all time high price point, then where would that take it? So we'll just input that here, 487 million. And there we can see that the price point of FIDA right now would actually be worth $4 and 10 cents or an upside of 12 X. So seems a little bit weird, right? So the previous all time high price point was at $10 and 87 cents. But if it had that market cap back then of that previous all time high, it would actually only bring the price to $4 and 10 cents or an upside of 12 X. 
And this is why it's super important to note things like the circulating supply. There is a lot more circulating now than there was previously. And this is the reason that the price has been diluted. Now, this is also another reason why most projects, let me tell you a secret, will probably not hit their previous all-time high prices. It's because there's just a ton of inflation and the, you know, the supply and the demand will be off. You know, there's not going to be enough buyers to continue the price point, considering that there is just more tokens entering supply, diluting the price, inflating the price, etc. That's why that's that's really important to note. And just just have that in the back of your head that most projects will not hit their previous all time high price points. They may hit their previous all time high market caps. Bond find up certainly could I, I think it could. But at the same time, that would bring the, the price as of right now to $4 and 10 cents. And who knows in the future when there's more tokens that are out and circulating, that could be lower, even if it had that market cap previously. So that's why market cap and circulating supply are super important to note. And that most people are lying to you when they're saying that this project is going to 50 X or hundred X really, you just got to break down the math. You can use the coin perspective in the description below. Now, when it comes to viewing market caps and really just setting our definitions, right? What makes a large market cap, which what makes a, you know, mid-sized cap, small cap, etc. Now, no one really has a clear example or definition and it can change over time. Obviously, as more capital gets injected into crypto, these, you know, metrics are going to change slightly. But for the sake of this, I would consider Bitcoin and Ethereum, you know, right market caps above 300 billion dollars i would call these the daddy caps all right so super you know big right large daddy caps now when it comes to large cap i would consider these to be above a billion dollars right so a lot of these projects here on the first page of cmc are above a billion dollars in market cap and when bitcoin is peaking at you know all-time high and, and if it hits its previous all-time high again then most of these projects on the first page will all be above one billion dollars probably now um so yeah that that large cap is again above one billion mid cap i would consider one billion to 500 million so these are what i would consider mid cap projects so these projects have more room for growth right they have smaller market caps it means that if there's more capital injected to the market cap then the price point can obviously go up and this could also go up even faster compared to for example the daddy caps or just the large caps in general because those market caps are so large that it's harder to you know inject more capital to increase the price point but with smaller market caps it's basically easier for just a little bit of capital to be injected and the price point to go up more. You can also go on, for example, CMC, and then you can click on, for example, filters, and then you can just click on add filter. And here you'll click on market cap, and then you can just set parameters in here. Now, also, when it comes to small caps, I would consider these to be around 1 million to 500 million. So I would consider these projects to be, you know, fairly small, so we have data caps of 300 billion to 1 trillion. Then we have large caps. These are above 1 billion. And then we have mid caps, which is 1 billion to 500 million. And then small caps. What is that? Small caps, I would consider 500 million to 1 million. And you can actually go on CMC, click on add filter, go to market cap. And then let's just click on, we'll see from a range of 1 million to let's just say 500 million. So here, we'll just input that. And then we'll click on apply. So 1 million to 500 million. And here we can just see some of the results in this range. So these are projects that, you know, are fairly small, but, you know, still, I think have some room for growth, obviously in the price point. And with a market cap, for example, of mask, right? A $414 million. This is telling me that this is a little bit more stable, obviously, than the small crypto gem range, which we'll talk about next, which is a lot smaller. So it's a little bit more stable, but there's still room for the price to grow. And, you know, I like these projects and personally investing into these as well myself. Now I would also rank, by the way, I would, I would just click on volume. So you want to look at projects that have a lot of volume. Um, it's super important. So the higher the volume, the better. Okay. More liquid as well to invest in less slippage. Now, when it comes to small crypto gems, I would consider these to be one to 50 million, which is super small. Now, obviously, this is still bigger than a project that only has a few hundred thousand dollars that's invested into, for example, a pre-sale of it, which 
in the next module, we're going to be talking about pre-sales, ICOs, etc. how projects get funding and different things to note when it comes to that, because that's super important. Also vesting. So we're going to talk about that then in the next module. So stay tuned, buckle up for that. We got a lot of stuff coming. Okay. So yeah, I would define the one to 50 million as the small crypto gem uh, range. Reason being is because these projects above a million at least have some capital, some liquidity. There's some, you know, notoriety. There's some, you know, obviously people have a, you know, intonation that this project is decent, right? And people have put a million dollars worth of capital into it to prop it up. So I think it has some momentum at that stage. And from all the way to 50 million, there's just a ton of room to grow for these projects to continue to 10, 50, even 100x. And so that's personally why I like to really get into projects that have the one to 50 million. There's at least enough momentum. And if you project, find a project with enough narratives and trends uh, to go along with it, then the, the idea of it going to you know 100x, 50x is certainly plausible on the table, in my opinion, of course. Now, we're also going to go uh, into narratives and trends in another module. So stay tuned for that as well. And, you know, when it comes to these smaller market caps, there's obviously a lot more room to grow, but there's at the same time, there's a ton of risks associated with these projects. Like I said earlier, some of these projects are not going to hit their previous all time highs. Another thing to note is that some of these projects are not going to find any momentum as well. Like they could just, you know, the team could be dead. It could be just an old project, no momentum, no one's interested, lack of volume. And with that, you know, you have to really, you know, pick and choose the proper ones, which will go obviously more, you know, go into more detail as to, you know, finding and just, for example, I'm going to go over an example of how I would do due diligence research on a project and then finally invest and add it to MetaMask and etc. which we'll go over that in the future. So stay tuned. And then the other thing to note is that, you know, when it comes to just the cycles, right? Like we have the bull cycle with bear, bear markets. When it comes to bear markets, I mean, Bitcoin usually and Ethereum and some of the top assets are usually the ones that are better to at least be in because the other ones will bleed harder against Bitcoin's downfall. So usually a lot of people will sell out all of their altcoins in a bear market. So that's also another important thing to note. All right, module 1.3, the life cycle of a cryptocurrency from ICO to mainstream adoption. So let's talk about that. First things first, when it comes to a project that you know has the idea of you know creating a cryptocurrency what is there there well you know before it used to be just you know is this project solving a problem now there's also the whole thing of just meme coins which is another topic but that's kind of also besides the point because the main ordeal of a project usually for the most part is to solve a problem right that's the whole thing that's why companies are formed that's why individuals do things, obviously, most of the time is to solve a problem. So for the most part, when it comes to a company that, you know, or a group of people or coders or just one single person that wants to start a project, the core idea is to solve a problem. So in some cases, maybe it's like, you know, they see a problem of, you know, high transaction fees when it comes to Ethereum or slow, you know, slow processing times with, for example, Bitcoin or low security or low decentralization they want to solve those problems in a project so they kind of formulate their different ideas and you know bring that all together and then they formulate the white paper which is basically the birth of the project that's like the entire idea written out in you know an academic format usually if it's a meme coin type of project usually there is kind of like a bs guide when it comes to the white paper but yeah for the most part it's usually like an academic paper so for example bitcoin's white paper mostly kind of highlights the you know the fall and collapse of you know the 2008 you know uh, global economy and all of that and satoshi nakamoto didn't like the idea of the u.s government having all control over the you know usd supply there was also an unlimited supply and they could just continue to print more and more so satoshi saw that as a problem and he wanted to solve it with an idea such as bitcoin that's what he did now there's a couple of different ways to for example fund a project right they they get the code out then they start really rolling and you know they're they're starting to market it they're starting to bring it to market and there's a couple of different ways for a project to get a coin into the market so let's go over that so when it comes to funding and initial coin offerings or ico or token generation events 
these are basically just fundraising methods. And it's, it's also important to note because there's different ways to fundraise a project. Now, there is ICOs or initial coin offerings. These are projects that sell new cryptocurrency tokens to investors to raise capital, often before the project is fully launched. Then there's also TGEs. So this is the token generation events. And this is similar to ICOs. Projects generate and sell tokens to fund development. This term is often used interchangeably as well with ICO. Then there's private sales. So funding is raised by selling tokens directly to a select group of investors at a predetermined price, typically before the public sale. So these are, think of the early birds, right? The big daddies, usually big, big funding companies, or they have the network and the know-how to get into these companies super early. Then there's IEOs or initial exchange offerings. So instead of selling tokens directly to the public, projects sell them through a cryptocurrency exchange, which conducts the sale and may provide a layer of trust and security with that. So you may have also heard pre-sale. So what is pre-sale versus ICO? So pre-sale, this is an earlier phase of fundraising that occurs before the ICO. During the pre-sale, tokens are typically sold at a lower price or with other incentives, like bonuses, to attract early investors. The funds raised during a pre-sale might be used to cover initial project costs, including development and marketing expenses, leading up to the ICO. Participation in pre-sales is often limited to a select group of investors or requires a higher minimum investment. Then there is ICO or initial coin offering. So the ICO is the main fundraising event where the project sells its tokens to the general public. The ICO usually happens after the presale and might attract a broader audience. The terms of the ICO are publicly announced, including the token price, the total supply of tokens for sale, and the fundraising goal. ICOs can be open to anyone interested in the project and typically have a lower minimum investment compared to pre-sales. So in essence, while both pre-sales and ICOs are methods of raising funds by selling tokens, a pre-sale occurs first and often targets a more exclusive group of investors under more favorable conditions. The ICO follows the pre-sale and is broader, more public phase of fundraising. Then there's also launch paths. So what is that? A crypto launchpad is also known as a blockchain or ICO launchpad is a platform that supports a new cryptocurrency projects in raising capital and gaining exposure within the crypto community. These platforms are designed to connect innovative crypto projects with potential investors, providing a space where projects can launch their tokens or coins, often through a pre-sale or initial coin offering before they become available on the broader market. And there's also a couple of different projects that, you know, are currently doing that. And some of these even have tickers. For example, Cedify has a ticker S fund. So this is a project that mostly focuses on the launchpad aspect and IGOs, for example, with Cedify. So here you can see some of the upcoming projects. You can see how much they've raised. You can see if it's a public or if it's a private, you can see the token price. You can also see different things like when, you know, when is it going to be registered from and when is it going to end when it comes to registration? So they also list like what the project is about. And if you click on it, you can learn more about it as well. So that's just like one site. Another one also is paid. So this is another launchpad type of project. And another thing to note with these, and this is Ape Launch, another uh, big one, Ape Terminal, also known as the name. And, you know, one thing with these is that some of these have it to where, you know, you invest in these, but then your supply is vested and you actually don't get all of your supply immediately. Matter of fact, usually you have your supply and then the, you know, the coin comes out into public supply for anyone to buy or sell. But usually after that point, only a certain supply of your tokens will be allowed for you to sell, send or swap or have. Meanwhile, the rest of your supply that you've invested typically is kind of held on for longer periods of time. And this is also known as like a vested cliff. And typically this is because they don't want people to all of a sudden just hand all their tokens over and then immediately sell all of their tokens because the price went up a lot. So oftentimes projects don't want all of that selling pressure immediately because it looks super bad on the price. And because of that, they make it so you only can have a certain amount of supply given a certain specification of time. So you know, given a certain date of time that comes up, for example, six months or so, 
then you'll be given a greater allocation of your supply. Another, let's just hypothetically say six months comes up, then you get more of your supply and then you'll be able to sell or do whatever you wish with it. Now, the key functions of a crypto launchpad include project vetting. So launchpads typically conduct due diligence on projects before listing them then evaluating their potential team, technology, and business model. This vetting process is intended to protect investors from scams and ensure that only legitimate projects are presented. There's also funding. So they facilitate the funding of new projects by allowing investors to purchase tokens at an early stage, usually at a lower price than when they are listed on exchanges. And this can benefit both investors who may gain from the price increase if the project succeeds and project developers who receive the necessary funds to develop their project. There's also exposure and marketing. So launchpads help projects gain visibility within the crypto community. By listing a project, a launchpad can provide significant marketing and exposure, attracting potential investors and users to the project. Then there's also community building. So they assist in building a community around new projects. A strong, engaged community can be a key factor in the success of a crypto project. There's also advisory services. So some launchpads also offer advisory services to projects, helping them with strategy, marketing, legal issues, and technical development. So basically they go to these launch pads because they know that these launch pad companies have all of the connections with exchanges and all of the top dogs in the investment world. And so knowing that they go to them and they get their money. And from there, they're also usually benefited from it. So it's kind of like a win-win scenario really for everyone. So that's, that's mostly the point of these projects. Now, when it comes to, you know, eventually mainstream adoption and, you know, public initial offerings as well, you know, really you don't see a lot of, you know, stability and eventual maturity with the project until a lot of other, you know, potential ecosystem projects get involved with that project as well. So for example, if a project is building an L1, it really doesn't reach maturity until a lot of other projects are building on it and using it and developing it on it. This is when maturity starts to form and a project isn't necessarily like this new brand new project, right? So that's kind of how I think of it, at least. Risks and rewards of small cap projects. Let's get into this. We are on module 1.4. Let's dive in. So first things first, you know, this is my personal view, but obviously if you don't take risks, you don't have rewards. And if you don't take large risks, you don't have high rewards. So if you've ever heard of the saying, scared money, don't make money, that's basically where this comes from. Now, that's obviously not for me to say that you're supposed to gamble all your money away on small projects, not at all, okay? Now, let's get into just looking at a small cap project, looking at it and just kind of seeing the fundamentals of it, just getting a brief overview and doing some due diligence and just risk assessment on a project. So a project that I like is called Mintlayer and it currently has that market cap below $50 million. Currently it's sitting at $40 million. When we're taking a look at the market cap, it's trading at around 62 cents. There is on CMC, a supply of 400 million. This is actually a little bit wrong and you have to go to the website and I'll show you guys how and what that actually looks like. Now on here, we can see that it's listed on a couple of exchanges, but not the big, you know, main exchanges, like for example, Binance, Coinbase, Kraken, it's not listed on those or even Bybit. It's only listed on gate.io or MEXC, which for most projects, these are fairly easy listings to get listed on these exchanges. But overall, it still opens up a decent amount of uh, you know, volume, you can see that even on MEXC, there's $665,000 has just come into this project buy and sell in the past 24 hours. That's pretty good. And you'll see that that is 46% of the volume as well. And then you'll see that it is actually trading on a DEX like Uniswap. Now, when it comes to this project and just looking at it, we can see that, you know, there's a couple of news articles that have posted about it. We can see here some of the main, like the unique selling points about it. And Mintlayer is a layer two solution that allows users to build a decentralized finance ecosystem rooted in the established network of the Bitcoin blockchain, opening Bitcoin to DeFi, smart contracts, atomic swaps, NFTs, and dApps. So the first thought is, well, you know, if this project is, you know, building, you know, as a side chain next to, you know, Bitcoin and trying to develop on top of Bitcoin, which is obviously king and is probably never going to go away. This is a bullish factor and it's definitely a project that could be extremely bullish within the narrative of Bitcoin in general. 
And if you take a look at a project that has built upon Bitcoin security, that is actually Stacks. Stacks also has a market cap of $3.7 billion. And you can see here that the price has gone up quite a lot currently. You know, it was previously trading at 99 cents, you know, just a few months ago, really. And now it's trading at $2.58. So we can see that there is obviously a need for this project. It's also listed on, for example, Binance, Coinbase, right? Some of the big exchanges, OKX, KuCoin, Bybit, Kraken. So these exchanges have listed it, which kind of says that the project is is what it says it is. It says that the contract is actually good, the contract address, and that the tokenomics are fair. And so if these exchanges list it, usually the project is pretty fair for the most part. Now, obviously there's caveats to that. Now, when we're taking a look at, for example, Mintlayer, we can see that you know compared to this project, Stacks, it's much smaller at only 40 million. And they're also building, for example, atomic swaps. They're building as an L2 solution. And, you know, it seems fairly interesting, you know, when we're taking a look at it on paper. So if we just go to the website here, we can see that, you know, the website looks very good. I mean, I know website, talking about the website actually seems kind of weird, right? But I've gone to projects that look super promising on paper, and then you go to the website and it just looks like a ghost town or it looks like your grandfather built it. Those are the projects you probably want to avoid. So overall, the website looks pretty good. It lists all of the different features about the project as well. And so it says tokenization ecosystem, decentralized finance, value transfer and exchange. There's also a wallet that's associated with it. There is staking as well with this. And so it seems quite promising. Now, if you go into it, you can read even more about it. And also another thing to note is the roadmap. Here you can see all of the plans for the project in the future. And you can see what they've done in the past uh, from the concept to idea, right? To where they are now, token generation event, and just the launch of everything, the test net, launch of the main net. You can see where they are with everything and also what they plan to do in the future and beyond, which is also a good thing to note. Now, another thing to take a look at is also just taking a look at the team. And the team being public is not necessarily, you know, a, something that has to be a thing, right? Because for example, there's projects that are, you know, have all the good fundamentals that, you know, people have, for example, invested in, for example, one to note is Rune, so Thorshame. This project has a fully anonymous team and the project also has $1.7 billion of a market cap at the 50th position. And so this project, fully an, uh, you know anonymous team, no one knows who they are, who built it. And with that, they have that type of market cap and conviction. So having a public team is not necessarily you know the be all end all, but at the same time, it is a bullish thing to note with the project. So here you can just take a look at the team members You can get involved with kind of like who they are. You can see where, like what their socials are. Maybe you want to see, you know, check them out on, for example, LinkedIn here, you can do that and just take a look at who they are and some of the things that they've done, projects that they've worked on, etc. So that's just one thing to note. And like, like I said previously, it's not necessarily the be all end all to have a public team, but it is definitely one thing that is definitely, you know, something to note at least. And you can also go to some of their, you know, for example, their socials, for example, like YouTube and try to see if they have, for example, AMAs or ask me anything's where, for example, they, the team talks about what they're doing and, or is actually active and you know listing stuff so here you can see that they've listed a staking guide for their project and you can also go to their you know for example twitter is also a good one to note and see just how many followers they have see you know what they're about on here where they're also based what they've been tweeting about have they been active this is also one thing to note it looks like they are active they're posting daily it looks like almost just about daily and they're also in podcasts and looks like they're answering different questions to the community. So these are bullish things, to, bullish things to note. It basically means that the team is active, they're present, they're building 
and they're also displaying that to the community. You can also check out various other things, like for example, the Discord and Telegram groups and see what they're about there. Now, you should also take a look at the you know the website and take a look at the token on there because this could actually vary from for example the listing on cmc sometimes they're not fully accurate and so it's important to at least check the website and see what either their plan is for the uh you know fully circulating supply and max total supply and also the current supply so here if we just scroll down we can actually take a look at some of the pre-seed sales so that was around just you know under a percentage of the total supply we can see that there is a seed sale another one so 13.65 percent of the supply so these people got in super early for a super cheap price these people got in early for a cheap price and more of these got in early for cheap prices and so here's there's also uh, long vesting. So this is basically people that have invested into this. At, so there's 13% of the total coins um, that have been invested into long vesting. And with this, it basically means that they won't be able to, per the TGE, per the token generation event, they won't be able to sell their supply immediately. They'll have to wait and hold on to it for a specified period of time. There is short vesting, which is a, obviously just a shorter period of time that they are allowed to get the allocation of their supply that they've initially invested in. And it will obviously be shorter than the longer supply, of course. And then they have some towards marketing and listing. You know, sometimes it costs thousands and thousands of dollars to get a project listed on exchanges. So that's why some of that's there. You can see that there is protocol development, community incentives, team and advisors, company reserve. So all this looks fairly standard here we can see that the tokens at launch are to be 400 million which if you take a look at cmc that seems to be correct there is a max supply here of 400 million the total supply of 400 million but if you dive a little bit deeper you can see that this project also involves staking so there's 200 million involved for staking so here we can actually see that the eventual total supply will be 600 million so if we just take a look here, the actual max supply should be 600 million. So this is actually wrong. And so it's important to note this on CMC that sometimes with small projects, they're not fully listed or maybe their API keys are not fully correct with actually what the project is saying. So the total supply is 400 million, but the actual max supply is, is actually 600 million, if that makes any sense. So, and they even go into this a little bit further. So at the launch of the mainnet, 400 million ML will be created. Each mint layer block will generate a block reward for the block creators until the total supply reaches 600 million, AKA this is for staking, staking rewards. So this is expected to happen approximately 10 years after the Genesis block. Also the Genesis block just recently happened about 20 days ago as of the recording of this video. So the mainnet was up. So in about 10 years from now, the uh, total max supply will be all out and that will be the 600 million. You can also see the unlocking schedule. So you can see with pre-seed, seed, marketing listing, etc. And if you just take a look at this, the token generation event, boom, it started. And then within three months, people will get more allocation, uh, more allocations of their tokens to eventually sell or maybe hold on to or do what they want with. So for example, you can see there is the seed and pre-seed you know you can see each amount over time that comes into their hands so this is one thing to note you know around you know 13 to 15 months it looks like a very large supply will be out for most of the pre-seed and seed people and then eventually that kind of gets topped off right so that's one thing to note is that more will enter supply and more people will at least have the option to sell does it you know when a lot of people talk about tokens entering supply it can be bearish yes but at the same time you also need to note that oftentimes a lot of people it just really depends on the project in general and if people are still bullish if there's more buyers and sellers and you know what their conviction of is of the project for example some of these people may want to hold on to their you know tokens maybe you know some of the seed people and pre-seed people that get a hold of their tokens you know within a year Maybe they just want to hold on to it, hold it for a year or two and see where the price actually goes. Maybe they're super bullish on it and they're holding it for a long time. So that's also one thing to note as well there. So overall, this project seems quite bullish and, you know, it's a project that, well, personally, I'm already invested in. And so 
that's why, you know, taking a look at all these features, just, you know, just from the top of, you know, the website to the tokenomics and stuff. Overall, it looks fairly good on paper, right? And so we can even take a look at, for example, because they, they have a contract on Ethereum, but there is a mainnet. So we can actually see here a couple of other different factors, like the amount of holders here. You can see the holder gain just in from, you know, February 8th to just now. And the 22nd, it's up 2.2%. If we take a look at DEX trades, we can also just see, you know, where is the, let's just take a look at, for example, if we see any whales, you know, here we can see if we see any whales or big buyers. You can also, another thing to do is not just clicking on this and taking a look at Etherscan alone, but also just copying the address then going to a website called Dex Tools and then pasting the address here. And if you just take a look at ML slash WETH or WETH, we can take a look at it here and we can see the Dex School, the, sorry, the Dex Tool score. And we can see that it's ranked at 99. That's pretty good. It means also taking a look at the contract verified. Yes, it's verified, um, verified external audits. We can see that there's no honeypot, so lack of scam basically. So this is whether the token is a honeypot, which means that the token maybe uh, cannot be sold because of the token's contract function, aka basically you buy onto it and then you can't sell it at all. So only the owner can sell to it. That's a honeypot. Sometimes projects list buy or sell tax, which is not a scam. Um, a lot of projects do it to increase incentivizations for the project to increase development or marketing or different things like that. But you know, and oftentimes you see like a max of around 5%, anything more than 5% buyer sell tax is a little bit sketchy. And it's not something I like to really touch. Um, two projects that I do like that do have buy and sell tax, for example, one Dion protocol that has a buy and sell tax. Another one is OPSEC. That's another one that has a buy and sell tax as well. Here, you can also just see community votes. And that doesn't really mean a whole lot or tell you much, but it's definitely one thing to note. And then you can also take a look at just different buy and sells and see if you see any whales or maybe large sellers or something to note. And you can also take a look at their addresses on Etherscan if you want to dive into those a little bit further. So overall, just on paper here, we can see that this project is also pretty decent, right? I mean, there's a decent amount of holders. The holders are growing. It's listed on some mid-tier exchanges. You can see that there's a decent amount of liquidity, volume, and also you know, a fairly smaller market cap, right below 50 million, but it has the potential to reach much greater comparing it to another one, for example, like Stacks, which is another project building on Bitcoin. Or you can also just see that there is also momentum with the project in general and that people are interested in it, which you can obviously see this here. Now, a community member actually pointed out in the school group, this project, Memeinator. Memeinator, it sounds weird to say. And so this is a pre-sale and how it works is basically you're supposed to invest either with ETH or USDC and you can actually choose a network. So it can be on, for example, Binance, um, Binance Smart Chain, or it can be, for example, even a debit card if you so choose. Now, along with that, you are connecting and then you're entering to pay a specific or a specified period. For example, you want one ETH worth of these tokens. You can do that here. With this, again, you would have to connect your wallet and you'd also be in a certain stage. And, you know, if we just take a little bit further at this project, obviously it's a meme coin, but you just kind of beg the questions, like a couple things, like for example, one, like, you know, what's the point of having a pre-sale, having your funds actually locked up and not allowed to even, you know, be able to do what you want with, you know, sell if you so choose. And then when it comes to, you know, the token, it basically just says it's like trying to kill, you know, Pepe is trying to be the next like Sheeb, right? Because the whole thing in the meme coin, you know, meme coin economy, you could say is that, you know, Sheeb came about to eat and kind of destroy Dogecoin. And then after that, there was other projects, right? There was Bonk, there was, you know, Pepe, there was Pork, right? Pepe 2.0, right? All of these different projects that have just come about trying to eat up markets, market share within the meme, you know, area. And so almost at this point, it seems like that narrative is kind of overblown of projects trying to eat each other. And that's the whole thing of this right now. 
And then at the same time, if you just take a look at the tokenomics, you'll see the 62.5% is into a presale. And looking a little bit further, you don't really see you don't see like that there's any type of vesting schedule along with this. And so if you take a look at some of the earlier stages with, for example, this project, you'll see that these people are already up, for example, at stage two, they're up 165% on their initial investment mm -hmm. and going to each stage, which currently I believe it said it was on like 14 or 15 people are up, you know, 40%, you know, 32% on their initial investment with this project. And it doesn't say much about any type of vesting or anything like that. So essentially it means that, you know, this amount of people that have invested into these previous stages, and it says here that the total in just stage 15 is $4.9 million that's raised. And this is probably going to be a large amount of selling pressure per the initial coin offering when it eventually comes out, because it doesn't really talk much about the vesting period. It really just, basically says your supply is liquid once it's, you know, once the supply and the token eventually comes out. So overall, I would be super bearish about this. I wouldn't touch it. I don't like getting involved with these really shit coins and just shitty projects that make it so you have to lock up funds. There's no real actual need for the project or even if it's like just for fun as like a meme coin is, why not have a fair launch? Why not have it for anyone? Why have the whole thing as to get in early, get in early, right? That's the whole marketing ploy for this. But in reality, people are probably going to get burned. There's probably going to be a ton of selling pressure. And yeah, I wouldn't touch this project with a 10 foot pole. And, you know, I don't really touch meme coins that much, but I definitely wouldn't lock up any funds for a project like this at all, because you're basically just getting in with a bunch of other people who think you're early and you're just up on your initial investment. And then immediately, once you get the supply, you'll immediately dump the token. So yeah, that, that's just like one, you know, project or example of something that I obviously wouldn't touch. I, you know, I mentioned earlier that I like projects that have that one to 50 million, but I like also if they have fair launches and or if they didn't have a fair launch, at least I wouldn't touch that project personally. But, you know, for example, if you go to, you know, a launch pad, you know, S fund, C to five or ape terminal, these at least have done a, a fair bit of vetting with the project. So for example, here is D chat and you can read more about it. You can see when the sale ends, etc. And so you can see a little bit more here. And also with these launch pads, typically like the big, big launch pads, usually there's a decent amount of vetting, like I said, with the project and like for example, Ape Terminal or Paid Network or C to Fi S Fund, they want to look good, obviously, and they want people to be up on their initial investments. And so it's basically in their best interest for you to get a return on your money, anyways. So I would more more so um, you know get into these projects that you know at least have you know more vetting through launch pads. So. When it comes to super early and not even listed, you know, publicly listed as well for anyone, then I would at least probably go with a launch pad personally, but I wouldn't go with like a private presale type of thing just based off of the website alone. Usually I wouldn't go near those because they're just too risky for me. But yeah, personally, I like the fair launch and or I would like a presale that's based off of a reputable launch pad type of project. So that's just that these, this is, you know, risks of small cap projects because, you know, at the end of the day, you don't want to invest and lock your funds up into some type of shit coin. And then for them to, to just pull the rug directly under you, you know, you wouldn't really know. So you gotta be safe out there. Be careful, protect yourself. Spotting trends in crypto. So we have trends and narratives, and we're gonna talk about how they play out, how to find them, look at different crypto narratives, etc. So welcome to module 1.5. Let's get into this. So this is the last video of this module. Hopefully you guys like it so far. So I've been enjoying making it. It's been super time consuming, but overall it's quite fun to do. So it's been super challenging, but super fun at the same time. So. Anyways, let's get into this. So first things first, here's just like a chart of how the market really thinks often. And I wanna show you guys this because it's super important to note because when we're, we're taking a look, when we're taking a look at, you know, when prices are in peak 
valuations and you know they're just trading over to what they should be trading this is kind of what the market is going to be telling you so there's going to be a start of disbelief when you know the market starts to kind of have a, a brief rally there's also optimism and then there is the belief thrill and euphoria this is when just you go on for example r slash cryptocurrency the subreddit and you just see everyone's thinking that the price of bitcoin is going to go to a million dollars the price of eth is going to go to a hundred thousand dollars within the next two days and the price of doge is going to go to a dollar and the price of pepe is going to go to a dollar so this is when people are just absolutely crazy they're also saying things like diamond hands Total, hold on to your your coins your assets don't sell you know only losers sell this type of like ape mentality and this is something you know a trap that you don't want to fall into i actually don't even observe um, anything that's happening on for example r slash cryptocurrency or even on twitter i actually will only look at occasional things that pop up on Twitter of just specific people. But for the most part, I don't even use or waste my time with Reddit or Twitter. Because oftentimes, you either a don't know if an account on socials is a bot, and maybe they're actually, you know, maybe a project a really shitty project is paying like a company to, you know, have bots and just post the name and say, for example, this ticker, I'm super bullish on because of this, this, this. And so you, you basically have to reduce the noise and you, you can't really differentiate if you know or don't know the bots on social media. And so oftentimes you don't really want to look at, for example, on Reddit, see what they're saying, because you don't know if they're either invested in the project, they're being paid by the project or they're bots like you don't know. And so that's super sketchy. And so you just kind of want to separate yourself from that or at least, you know, be around it and be in the community, of course but at least have the mindset of this chart right here. So at least know that when prices are reaching peak valuations that and you know and in euphoria and when your grandma starts talking about what is what is bitcoin at you know the dinner table that's when it's probably peak time to sell, okay? So of course not financial advice or anything, but when the market is really just you know cooking and everyone's talking about it Usually this is the time when, you know, people, you know, especially smart money is using all of these new retail tra traders that get in here. They're using them as exit liquidity and they're just going to dump all over them. So you don't want to be dumped on. So right after that, then there's the anxiety, the denial, the panic, and then capitulation and just anger. It's when people are starting to say crypto is dead. When, they, when people start commenting crypto is dead or I've seen an occasional black swans in the r slash cryptocurrency subreddit. I actually, no joke, have seen the pinned comment and pinned post of the suicide hotline. So when you start seeing the suicide hotline or, you know, people are saying that crypto is dead, this is the time when I personally start to really enter the market and start to, you know, put my liquidity into the market. And you can just see that right here. Um, here's a video that I made about Solana. This was around a year ago now at this point. <clears throat> and with that, I was talking about Solana. I, I was, you know, actually quite bullish on the project while it was here. You could actually see the, the price point in the video that I talked about, and it was trading at around $22. And I was talking about why I'm bullish on it, you know, the Solana Foundation, you know, how it works, tokenomics, and also just like the developers and some key key findings that I found as to why I was still, you know, and also acquiring a bullish narrative towards Solana. Now at the time, Solana was just heavily beat by FTX, right? FTX heavily invested into Solana. And so when FTX came down, the initial thought was that Solana was going to tank and just go to absolute zero and no one was going to be interested in it anymore. Now Solana has always had problems such as the blockchain being paused, but at the same time, Solana is also extremely fast, extremely cheap, and there were a lot of developers and still are building on it. And a lot of projects that were starting to seem more interested in building on Solana than, for example, on Ethereum. So when I started to see that narrative change, I was thinking, okay, I am bullish on Solana. Now, if you were to go to, for example, Twitter at the time, you would see posts like this from prominent individuals. For example, this guy is also a YouTuber. A lot of people 
like hearing his advice, but he was saying, Solana is now below Tron and even Sheeb. Sadly, I think this is EOS 2.0, aka a dead project. Devs don't want to build on a dying infrastructure, Solana projects likely to migrate to EVM L2s. This was on December 27th of 2022. If we take a look at the price of Solana on December 27th on of 2022, we can see here that it was trading at and around $9. So basically at the peak bottom, he was basically kicking on it when it was down and he was super bearish on it. And he's obviously a key QOL, a key opinion leader, right, in the space. And so if you were to see that and then sell right before, you know, it rallies and goes to $100 where it is now, you know, you would have taken the L. And so this is why I don't like to go on Twitter. I don't like to go on Reddit because at the end of the day, if you kind of just think about the human experience and just, you know, from the psychological level, we're just fed all of these thoughts and very rarely do we have an original thought of our own. And so it's important to have your own original thoughts and your own original opinions that you have and that you aren't just fed from other people. And so this is why I try to stay away from things like social media or just Twitter, right, or Reddit. And because at the end of the day, you wanna develop your own thought and thesis. And that's what I did in this video. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm up a lot in my salon investment. And I actually sold uh, around half of my supply at around $100. It was like $90, I think I sold a large portion of my supply and I was up quite a lot. So taking profits for me was a good thing at the time. And Solana drove into this amazing just narrative. A lot of people were super bullish on Solana saying that it was going to take over ETH. Now, I, do I think that's going to be the case? No, but I definitely think that more projects will continue to grow and build on Solana. And I think that the market share of Solana will grow as an L1 in general. And the other thing to note along with that is when Solana started to really take off, other projects that were onto Solana, for example, and building on Solana, or just meme coins of Solana, for example, Bonk, this project grew to a super large valuation and the price just completely rallied to as well after this. And there's other projects now that are listed and that are you know, building on, and for example, our tokens on the Solana blockchain. And these projects have really taken off just in the past, you know, within the past year or so. So that's one thing to note is that when other people are, for example, fearful or, you know, bearish on a project, maybe then maybe think the contrarian, maybe be bullish, right? The famous Warren Buffett quote, right? Be fearful when others are greedy, be greedy when others are fearful. So this is also just an important mindset, I think, to have, especially when entering market. So when we're taking a look at things a little bit further here in crypto, there are a ton of different narratives and these come and go right in crypto, you know, for example, within a past month or so, that's old news at this point. So you also really have to note that these things just come up and go, they come and go. And, and it's important to, for example, hop on the surfboard, right? As the wave is starting to go and then go on it for as long as it can. But after a while, it usually kind of at least fades a little bit. So for the most part, you know, for here, we can see on CoinGecko, these are some of the key narratives in 2024. There was, for example, liquid restaking tokens, liquid staking derivatives, blockchain modularity, layer ones, um, different things like that, layer two optimistic rollups and all of that. These are actually all mostly old news. Now, here's actually a pretty good post about all of the different narratives. This is on Dune Analytics. I can leave a link in the description below for this. Here we can see that there is a list of narratives also with some of the tokens that represent the narrative as well and some of the key key tokens in these narratives. Now there's account abstraction, there's AI. This is basically one of the biggest narratives that I'm in right now that I'm the most bullish on at least because I, I just think AI is going to be the one of the key leaders in this you know bull market. There's also app chain, DeFi blue chips, there's Dex, there's Dex aggregators, domains such as ENS, FIDA, that was one I talked about previously, but it's not listed on here. GambleFi, right? Blockchain bets. There is Rollbit, okay? GameFi, um, Ape, right? Interoperability, Layer 1s, L2s. 
there's meme coins, there's meme 2.0s as well. <laughs> there's NFTs, real world um, assets as well, RWAs, privacy, perp decks, tons of stuff, okay? And you can also read more about some of these big narratives as well and read more about them. And in order to find some of these narratives in key leaders, you need to stay up to date. And this is why I actually think it's really important to be, for example, in a group like my own, which is Crypto Gems, which you'll find in the link in the description below on school.com. And this is my group where I share everything from market analysis to trends, narratives, things like that, that I see. And so obviously staying up to date is one of the biggest things to obviously find these narratives. And so if you're on, for example, new sources, you'll find narratives and things like that. But at the same time, if you're on news sources, if you're on Twitter, if you're on Reddit, if you're any of those places, you're probably too late. And so, for example, AI is, an, is a hot narrative, but it's been taking off now for a while. And so in order to find the narrative before it obviously even happens or find a narrative where a lot of liquidity or capital is flowing into, you really need to look on chain or look at what funds are doing. So, for example, Binance Research post some of their, you know, their themes for 2024, some of their predictions and things like that. And you can read all of the different things that's happening and they post a ton of on-chain analysis and research along with this. So it's also a cool thing, cool report to take a look at. You can see all the changes within, for example, layer ones, Bitcoin, and just beyond. There's just a ton of information. And for example, this is 140 pages of analysis that you could read about in charts and try to figure out and develop your own opinions based off of. So different funds, um, for example, obviously Binance Research is not a fund, but I know Binance does have a portion, a part of it that does invest into projects early, but, and, and you can take a look at Binance Research, but you can also take a look at other capital funds that are in the crypto space, see what they're bullish on and what they think uh, the narratives could be. So for example, here you can see the top crypto capital firms. So you can see Coinbase Ventures, Binance Labs, KuCoin Ventures, Sequoia, right? All of these. And so for example, one strategy you could have is you go to their websites, see what they're talking about, and also see kind of like what they're shilling. Some of these projects and just, you know, these capital firms are so invested into these projects and they're literally vested, like they they have a locked supply. And so it's up to them to basically shill the project and post it everywhere. They want people to be bullish on it. They want people to invest in it. And if you find those early and find those reports super early of what they're you know invested in, that could be a bullish thing to note because if these big companies like Binance Labs, Coinbase Ventures are, you know, bullish on a specific project and or invested, they obviously want the price to go up. Now, a project that I'm thinking about is actually Altlayer. A lot of people thought that a lot of people were going to be selling their Altlayer supply per the token generation event. And actually, that's not true. A lot of these companies were invested into Altlayer and it's really up to them to want the price to go obviously up and they want to shill it as much as possible. They want it to drive a narrative. And so, you know, I'm just a small little shrimp, but at the end of the day, these large whales want to promote a project, they're probably going to be successful doing it. And also, also usually if they have a good track record in the past of other projects, then they could drive narratives further. Another good place to go to is actually Santiment. Now, Santiment is a on-chain analysis platform and they share a lot of cool, interesting metrics. They share a lot of charts and like, for example, here you can see like the price of Bitcoin overlaid on the daily active addresses. And you can see uh, basically a, a ton of like, for example, on-chain analysis types of stuff. You can see some social stuff. Like if, you know, for example, the social community is super bullish on what's happening right now, you can see different things like that. You can also take a look at the social trends and you'll see, for example, different uh, either tickers or projects being talked about. And you'll see like the social dominance. And these are really cool things to just kind of take a look at what people are talking about at the minute. But at the same time, if, for example, you know, sentiment is taking data from Twitter and other sources on social media, which they are, and there's tons of bots that are just posting the ticker of, for example, like, I don't know, Jasmine, right? And they're posting that ticker constantly, then it'll show up on here and look more bullish, if that makes any sense. So it's important to also like 
take it with a grain of salt, let's just say. Now, another platform that I absolutely love is called Nansen. And you do have to pay for it just like you do have to pay for the Santamid platform. But for me, Nansen is really worth it. And I, it's gonna sound like I'm selling Nansen, but I'm not obviously involved with them at all. I wish I was, I wish I could sell it um, because I could easily sell it, but at the same time, I'm not. So yeah, so, uh, Nansen is a on-chain analysis platform and they show a lot of cool stuff. And one of my favorite features is just the token inflow. It's super simple, super easy to use, and it just shows where smart money is being invested in. So this is the smart money emoji that they use, but this is to represent it. Smart money does not mean large money as well. So a lot of people think that smart money basically just means you know large capital funds, large investments and things like that. Not necessarily the case. Smart money can also be medium sized dex traders, like $30,000 of a total portfolio a balance. And with these accounts, these are people who are, this is money, sorry, from people who are smart money and basically that means they are consistently, usually profitable traders, index traders, etc. So these are people that are not just using exchanges, they're also using wallets. Why is that important? Well, people who are using wallets and are trading on a decentralized exchanges are usually getting into projects super early before they're listed on exchanges. So if these are traders that are, you know, intermediate, at least in the space, aka they're using wallets and decentralized exchanges, and they're also consistently profitable on chain, then that's a bullish thing to note. And if they are consistently putting in large sums of money into these projects, maybe it's worth at least taking a look at. And so here we can just see like Ollie, this is a project that I posted to my group when it was trading, I think at like 30 cents, or sorry, three cents fairly recently, it's up 129% just in the past seven days. And obviously, this project is going a part of the AI narrative right now. And so you'll see that just in the past 24 hours, $1.9 million of smart money, these are all smart money people who have invested that amount. It could be either one person that made a super large investment, or it could be a ton of smaller other profitable traders who are consistently profitable that put in that amount of money. And so this project is probably worth taking a look at. And also, you know, at this point, there's also been so much money that's been injected. It's also important to note when a project is just, you know, oversaturated and when it's due for a correction, because usually a price point is not just going to continue to rally. Usually there is some type of correction or bounce back, pull back, you know, that that takes place. Another project with, uh, that we can see here is Blur. This is a project that's seen $900,000 of smart money being injected into the protocol as well. And so Blur is an NFT project and so NFTs haven't really fully recovered as well, but there are a couple of different NFT projects that are doing really well right now. So that could be hot, something to take a look at. If we look a little bit further, we can see Hashflow. People are investing into that project as well. The other cool thing to note is that when you hover over it, you can see when the project was deployed why that's important is because projects that are super old and get some type of investment in recently, it could be bullish, it could be bearish. Like you kind of have to take a look at it. If it's super old and the price has only just bounced a little bit, there's typically probably not enough momentum within the project. And so that's that's one thing to note. Now, if it's a fairly newer project and there's also a lot of money that's being injected into it, that's when the momentum happens and that's when the wave is beginning and that's when it's important to jump on. And so here you can see all of these different projects that, you know, are decent tickers to probably at least take a look at and, you know, study. But the thing is, is that these tickers change week to week, given what the trend is. Maybe it's gaming, maybe it's NFTs, maybe it's AI. And right now it's, it's currently a lot of AI and more like NFT right now, but these tickers change constantly. And so it's important to look every single day at what's happening in the market. Where's the money? Where's the capital going? You can also go to the token paradise here. You can also see just different things. Like for example, token flow. I like to go here and I like to look at the, the max age of the project. Like hypothetically, if it's maybe a 70 day old project and you know, let's sort down by the most amount of fresh wallets. So people who have just created a wallet, you know, fairly recently, and they are sending their funds there just in the past seven days. What is the max project? Currently that's Pandora. 
this project also has just recently been deployed in February 2024. I believe this is a part of the new NFT narrative of a new type of standard on Ethereum. I believe it's Ethereum 404, I think. And so this is also a new narrative that's popped up and that's been one just in the past you know, week or so. And if we actually pull this up here, we can see a little bit more about it, Pandora, and we'll just take a look at it on per CMC. We'll actually see that just it's it's already ranked at 280 and the, the price point is trading so high at $17,000 because there's only 10,000 ever to be out into supply. That's why. And if we just take a look at it, we can see it's the first ERC 404, which is an experimental type of mix of ERC 20 and ERC 721 implementation. So it's about NFTs and fractionalization for NFTs. And so it's kind of a part of this new narrative that's kind of propped up fairly recently. And so that's why there's been a decent amount of fresh wallet inflow and smart money inflow as well into this project. We can also rank by smart money inflow. So the top down, which is really cool. And again, we can see Pandora. We can see a couple of projects that I'm actually not familiar with. AIT, AIS, and just we can just do a little bit more research on that. Like I haven't seen AIT before. So I want to take a look at that. AIT. And we can see here that it is listed. We have to match the logo, by the way. You can also, for example, click on it. And from here, you can actually get the contract address. So if you just copy that address, you can also just paste that into, for example, CMC, and then you can just search it there. That's important to note as well. So here we can see it has a market cap of 38 million listed on really no centralized exchanges. And if we take a look at the all time high price, we can see that there is a decent amount of, you know, capital flowing into it fairly recently, a good amount of momentum with it. If we take a look at AIT tech, we can see a little bit more about what it's about. And I'll just go into here also just in the CMC description. So it's trailblazer in the domain of web three data infrastructure, placing significant emphasis on the annotation of data and training of AI models. So here we can automatically see that this is a part of data and AI. These are the two narratives that this project touches upon. And occasionally these narratives, for example, like data pops up with like render protocol or file protocol, right? File coin. And there's AI. So when a project can hit on these two narratives like this, it's also a bullish thing to note. And that's pretty interesting. So I would probably do a little bit more research about this further, look more into their, their website, their socials, and just try to get a hint more for the project and just get a taste of it there. So this was just a brief overview of spotting trends and narratives and just kind of the whole ordeal with kind of how that looks, but we'll dive deeper in on future modules. So anyways, guys, stay tuned for the next one. Welcome to module 2.1. So today we're gonna to be talking about the art of finding small gems. So stay tuned, buckle up, because in the next module, we're gonna be talking about all the analytical tools and things like that that you can use as well to find small cap gems, which is ultimately what I mostly use. Now, I also have some tea prepared for me today because we're on a new day here and I pretty much almost lost my voice after recording for a few hours last time. So let's get into this. So we're gonna be talking about the sources for discovering small cap gems. We're also gonna be talking about evaluating project fundamentals, technical and market analysis, risk management and small cap investing, and just staying ahead. So let's get into it. So as I previously mentioned, you know, small caps, I would define them between one to $50 million when it comes to the market cap. Ultimately, when it comes to social forms, you're probably not going to find them buried on these forms. Uh, for example, r slash cryptocurrency, mostly it's going to be talking about some of the main projects. They're going to be talking about, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and just, you know, random news, which is mostly just kind of drama. Like for example, here, just, it's just like drama news or, you know, Reddit adds Bitcoin and Matic to its balance sheet. Oh my God. Or BitBoy is fighting a meme coin founder on Friday. So stuff that's not even really relevant. All this is just entertainment. Just keep that at the back of your mind. So this is not for finding actual good projects, in my opinion. You could go to the daily discussion in r slash cryptocurrency, the subreddit, and just see what people are kind of saying. But, you know, oftentimes people could be 
either shilling a project or, you know, just talking about, for example, any specific project. Um, but ultimately, these could be bots as well. So that's something to note and, you know, just look out for it. Now, another thing you can also do is look up, for example, Ape Wisdom. And this basically consolidates all the tickers that Reddit is, for example, talking about. And this is based off of r slash cryptocurrency, r slash cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and some more. So you can see, you know, it's aggregated, aggregated data per uh, tags across multiple subreddits. So here you can just kind of scroll through, see like what is the top, you know, top tickers that are being talked about and, you know, do they really make sense or not? Oftentimes, again, these could be botted, like there just could be a ton of bots on social media, for example, on Reddit, talking about this specific project, which could ultimately make it look like a ton of people are talking about it when in reality, you haven't heard of it and neither has anyone else. So that's also something to note. I, again, I just, I don't really think you should even t take everything that you see on social media with a grain of salt, um, especially from our slash cryptocurrency. Usually they're always wrong. Like they'll always say like super bullish on a specific asset, but typically they're actually pretty wrong. They were actually, I would say the most bearish community when it came to Solana. So, and Solana has done really well, actually. So if you would have bought when they were all fearful, you would have been well off. So, you know, personally, I hold a contrarian view towards that. You can also go, like I said previously in another module to a platform called Santiment. This is an on-chain analysis platform which shows a lot of charting and different things like that. And we're, we're gonna get into more analytical tools in the next one. But Santiment is a little bit special because it takes a lot of the social sentiment and it makes it into cool charts. And what I actually, I think that sentiment really shines when it comes to trading futures. So for example, when an asset is talked about a lot on here, usually it's because it's pumping and you know it's already overbought. So a, a strategy that I've had would be to short the assets that get popped up on here, which are people are talking about and you know are just overbought or you know, the narrative is just kind of overdone at that point, and just retail is already into it. At that point, usually that's when I am getting out of those positions and or shorting. So that, that's kind of the strategy for that, which I'm not gonna have a, you know, futures trading type of tutorial in this course, but um, if you guys wanna request that, go to my school group and just direct message me, tell me you're looking for that, I'll make you one just on school, like a, a full course on that, on futures trading. So. Yeah, let me know. Um, another platform that you can go to find small gems is, for example, a launch path. Now I talked about Cedify before, I talked about paid network. There's also Ape Terminal, this is one I talked about. And you know, occasionally they have decent projects that get on here and oftentimes there's no KYC to opt in, which is also pretty cool to note. KYC is know your customer. It's something exchanges do where you have to upload photos of your passport or ID in order to be verified on the platform. And so some of these, you don't have to do that, which is nice. And there are some interesting projects that get popped up. For example, Ordi Bank. This one seems fairly interesting. It's all about borrowing and lending in the Bitcoin uh, sphere. And there's also another one, which is Beefy Labs, which again is like ordinals and it's BRC20. So it's within the Bitcoin ecosystem. So that one's pretty cool as well. So some of these that get popped up on here are actually interesting. There are a couple things to note again, when it comes to these platforms, which is you're pretty much going to be locking funds into this, you know, into these platforms and you may be vested for a small period of time. So you really ultimately have to take a look at all of the details when it comes to everything when it comes to investing into these. And ultimately, I would recommend that you read all of you know the papers, the, the token utility, the revenue, like everything about the project and ask questions, like ask questions all about it. So that's totally okay. So when it comes to the launch pad here, you can see some of the token metrics. So here you'll see the vesting. So when it comes to launch pad, 20% at token generation event, and then it's a six month linear lock. So basically, if you were to invest $100, what this is telling me just off the top of this without doing much other research <coughs> is that, so you invest $100 and then per the token generation event, aka when it's ready to be sold, um, bought or sold on the open market, then at that point, then you can only sell $20 worth of that $100 of the token. 
Now, of course, the price of it could obviously go up. And so you could be at a lot more than your initial $100 investment at that point as well, possibly. But at the same time, then you won't get the rest of your funds until six months after. So it's a linear unlock basically means that over the next six months, you will slowly get your supply back for you to be able to sell. And these platforms, again, they have to do this because they don't want people to basically just sell right as they get all their tokens immediately, right? It's not good. And so it could create a ton of selling pressure. Now, one of the most infamous selling pressures off of an initial ICO was internet computer or ICP, right? I always think of it insane clown, clown posse. Now it's kind of an American uh, cultural phenomenon, ICP and insane clown posse, but I don't think the rest of the world would know that. So <laughs> anyways, don't look that up. So when it comes to ICP, right? Currently it's trading at $12 and 60 cents and back per the initial you know, token generation event, you can see here it was trading at $420 and immediately fell all the way down to, you know, lows of $31 and even beyond. I mean, it continued to fall to around $5. And there was just so much just bearish pressure on this project. There was a ton of VC firms that got in on it and just immediately sold their entire supply. And ultimately, when a new investor comes into the space and then they see this chart, it doesn't look good, right? And so this this is a permanent tattoo of internet computer. And ultimately, even though, you know, the technology is really good and I'm bullish on this project, when new investors get into the space, they may not be. And so it doesn't look good. And so basically it's in the project's best interest for there to be a vesting period. So that's kind of why that's there. Now, a couple of things you can do with a project, of course, and I would recommend is looking at the white paper. And for example, Solana's white paper is 32 pages and it just kind of goes over everything about it from the tokenomics, the consensus mechanism. What you can actually do is just click control A and just copy and then just paste it into, for example, ChatGPT. Before you do that, you can write it like, you know, uh, give me a TLDR of this project and how it's better than its competitors and its USP unique selling points. So how, how is the project unique? And you can basically just feed it into ChatGPT and see what it says. You can oftentimes get, you know, just a couple sentences about it or, you know, explanations in a paragraph in a really easy to view format because oftentimes these papers are extremely, you know, academic, extremely technical. And along with that, it's a lot easier if you can kind of get a TLDR sense, very basic beginner sense from, for example, something like ChatGPT. So here you can see the Solana white paper authored by Anatoly Yakovenko introduces a novel blockchain, blah, 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 right? Uh, proof of history, consensus mechanism, which is different than others like proof of work or POS, which is definitely one of the main features. Again, proof of history, there's high throughput, security and recovery, efficient consensus, smart contract execution, scalability, performance, reduced latency. So it tells you all the cool things about this project in a really easy to view manner. So if you don't want to spend the time reading a 30 page white paper, you can of course just input the white paper to ChatGPT, see what it says about the project as well. Okay, so just by searching Solana team members, I was able to find you know a couple of different websites, uh, which basically just shows the team. It's actually also on the Solana website here. I just couldn't find it directly. And so you can read a little bit more about it. You can meet the core team as well if you want to join the community. And here you can see more about the project, the people. You can also go to their LinkedIn profiles and just do a, you know, a brief background check on who these people are, like what their background is, you know, did they go to some type of prestigious university or did they, you know, have they been in the, the web three space for a long time, you know, or maybe they were from a prominent financial background as well. That could be also a good sign. So ultimately you can easily do this with any project that you find. Now, for example, on CMC, you can also go to cryptocurrencies. And then if you go to recently added, and then from here, if you just sort by volume, you'll get the some of the top projects that have been added just recently. So for example, here you can see that StarkNet was added three days ago, and you'll see that it already has a FDV of 
close to 20 billion if i if i'm getting that right and then the volume is close to a million dollars as of right now you'll also see which blockchain that it's currently on as well you'll see that most of them are ether and blockchains as well so these are just some of the recently added projects that are added to cmc it doesn't mean that they've been trading for the past three days you know actively or publicly it does not mean that it basically just means that it's only been listed per cmc in these past days so you can also go through some of these and just take a look as well now like i said earlier you can of course sort by market cap size by like 1 to 50 million and look at those projects go through each list every single page and read more about them but you can also go to the recently added uh, cryptocurrencies on cmc and just sort by the volume is what i would recommend at least and then just take a look at some of these projects you know get a feeling for what they are what they're about and you know see and do your own research on that project welcome to module 2.2 now previously i told you guys that size matters well today we're actually going to be bashing that that's not really the case today i'm going to be telling you why it's all about the motion in the ocean okay and why you know tools are great but it's of course how you use them and how daily you use them like the art of finding a small cap crypto gem is it is an art and in order in order to get good at art you have to continue to do it over and over again you have to show up every single day put it in the work do research do analysis every single day this is ultimately how you're going to find the small cap projects okay so i'm going to point you guys in at least at least try to of course in my opinion in the right direction so that's ultimately what i'm trying to do with this course so i want to tell you guys about this token enq ai okay and how i came across it so I currently own 126,000 um, of these tokens. It's an ERC-20 token, so it lives on the Ethereum blockchain. And along with that, it's currently at $6,400. It's actually down 17% in the past 24 hours, which is quite bad. I should probably take profits on this project soon. We'll talk about profits in another module. Now, along with that, in order for me to DCA into this project, I actually let's let's take a look here. So I originally purchased, you'll see here, these are the values of when I purchased this project. This was 13 days ago. Here you'll see that I purchased three thousand dollars worth. So let's just hypothetically say three thousand flat, right? Even though it's three thousand eighty eight. So I purchased three thousand dollars worth of ENQ AI over the course of thirteen days. So I bought thirteen days ago and then I was a little bit more convicted, so I wanted to buy more. So I bought in more five days ago and along with that i've already 2x my initial investment considering that that was three thousand dollars of investment and i turned that into six thousand four hundred just within a few days now if you were to go to cmc right now and just click on new cryptocurrencies and just scroll through you'll see enq ai right here and you'll see that it was just listed and added to cmc four days ago but you'll also see that i was trading it 13 days ago so how did I get in early to this project? If you also take a look at the chart, the chart doesn't really make sense at all on CMC. I don't really think the data is properly aggregated. Currently, it's only on Uniswap. Um, it's, it's, I guess, processing on some of these other exchanges, but I've not really heard of these. I don't know how much volume is through these exchanges. Probably not much. Now, so the charting is also not really correct. I'm not sure if the market cap here is correct. If you were to go to, for example, Uniswap, you can see that the TVL is close to a million. The 24 hour volume is at 2.8 million. And if you also look at and just scroll over, for example, here, you'll see that just in the past year, the project is up 116%. In the past month, you'll see that it's up 292%. So how did I find this project? Why did I get into it early? Today, we're gonna to be talking about that. I used a tool in order to find this project. So let's go over those and just some tools that you can use, of course, to get into the market. Now, obviously there's data aggregators, okay? So there's CoinMarketCap, there is CoinGecko. Now, CoinGecko is, you could argue, like a clone of CoinMarketCap. They're both essentially clones over each other. And obviously that's good for the community because it provides you know a competitive edge for both these platforms. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I think there's a lot of great features on CoinMarketCap that I'm personally obviously a fan of. And there is one thing to note when it comes to CoinGecko. Usually they're a little bit quicker to list a project 
as well. So when it comes to listing projects on CoinGecko, usually it's a little bit faster and earlier projects usually have a little bit more, more accurate um, charting and a little bit more accurate market cap and things like that. So I'm a fan of both CoinGecko and CMC. I like to use CMC predominantly, but when it comes to super early possible DGEN projects, that's when I usually like to use CoinGecko the most. So obviously I recommend using CMC and CoinGecko for data aggregators. Now, when it comes to charting platforms, personally, I would recommend TradingView. I believe you have to have a type of subscription as well for this platform. In my opinion, it's worth it. And yeah. Um, now, along with that, when it, let's just talk about technical analysis because we're just gonna talk about this uh, once. So you'll see some people on YouTube talk about like, oh my God, you know, Bitcoin is, you know, going to its previous all time high and, you know, it's, it's battling, uh, you know, against previous, you know, resistance and now it's falling at support and, you know, let's just draw, you know, some lines here and, oh my God, you know, it's up, down, up, down, oh, this up, down, up, down, cross the RSI and of course over the MACD and that for that reason, it's going to go above everything else for the most part. That's bullshit. So just don't waste your time looking at that stuff. Of course, I use, um, I mostly just look at support and resistance. It makes everything easier for me. Some people put on like so many things on their chart and just make it look so confusing and just, you know, all of that. Or you'll see like a lot of people will sell, for example, different trading indicators. Usually all these are, are simplistic RSI or MACD indicators. RSI and MACD just show when the price or of the asset is for example overbought or oversold you can just go to indicators here just click on macd you'll see moving average convergence divergence and here you can just get a little bit more analysis at when the project could be overbought oversold etc and oftentimes when people are listing for example uh, or selling you a you know trading view indicator usually that's all it is it's a simplistic overbought or oversold type of thing. So you don't necessarily need to waste your money. And of course, also, if you were to look at the chart on Bitcoin here and think, oh my God, it's hitting its previous all time high here, you know, for that reason, it's probably going to sell and dump. If you would have sold there, you would have been a complete idiot just because of that. So at the end of the day, there are some elements that of technical analysis that I hate. And it kind of seems like it's almost like astronomy for men and people are just kind of drawing stegosaurus and, you know, dinosaurs in the chart. And for the most part, I don't like that. And I'm definitely not going to watch my time and waste my time. Sorry. Watching someone else draw some random lines in the chart and tell me that the price is going to go to a certain direction. But at the same time, when it comes to support and resistance, I do like to see where previous support and resistance is for the bigger assets. Now, if you were to, for example, look at, you know, ENQ AI and you were to tell me that, you know, the project is going to hit resistance here because it was at this previous all time high here. Um, and, you know, you should sell because of that, you know, it's hitting all time high again, it's overbought. I mean, you would have been a fool for doing that. So when it comes to these early projects, I don't know how much technical analysis or, you know, type of like overbought or oversold zones you can really use to gauge these projects, that's a lot harder. And so I don't waste my time doing that. But when it comes to projects like, for example, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the larger caps, then at that point, some of the technical analysis can reign true. And so for example, here, like you can see, obviously, Bitcoin is battling out with previous support. So support is an area where the price resistance goes. And usually there's a lot of selling pressure on this area. So here we can see there's previous resistance here, previous resistance here. We can see that it didn't hit resistance here, but here we can see it's hitting resistance at that previous line. So at the end of the day, other traders are going to see that it's hitting this line. So they're probably going to sell, take profits, buy in again down here, and then the price maybe could break it again in the future. Again, you know, at the end of the day, is this something you want to look at and gauge everything on? Probably not at the end of the day. But here you can also see that there was, let's just toggle this onto the day view and we'll take a look a little bit further. Also just remove these drawings really quick. And here we'll just take a look at and draw a horizontal line here. So if you do that, you'll see that the price point bounced off of this previous uh, support 
previously, right? So I did that multiple times. So this area is probably of significance. And here you can see that there was a lot of, for example, buying buyers right here at this line. Here, there was a lot of actually selling when it came to hitting this line, people were still buying, but overall selling straight through it. So because it broke that previous support, the price fell through completely. So that's ultimately what I see about that. You know, you don't have to get super technical with this and pretend that you know what you're doing, like that you can just gauge where the future of the price is going to go based off the chart. It's just not fully accurate. And in my opinion, I like to look at technical analysis for support and resistance when it comes to buying and selling and getting finding good entries when it comes to some of the bigger large caps, right? Bitcoin, Ethereum, and again, the large caps. But when it comes to all the smaller ones, I'm not going to waste my time, honestly, when it comes to charting and stuff like that. So again, here you can see that there was looks like a lot of resistance here, resistance here, but it turned into support again in the future. So some of these lines are significant, some are not, but it's ultimately up to you. Some people say it's the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And, you know, personally, I'm not much of a big fan when it comes to technical analysis. That's why you don't really see it much on my channel as well. Now, in order for me to find this project and get a 2x on that, I actually went to Nansen. And Nansen is one of my favorite when it comes to on-chain analysis. It's actually around $100 to sometimes I think $120 a month. So it is a little bit on the pricier end, but in my opinion, it's definitely worth the gains. For example, you know, I already made $3,000 on that trade. And so because of that, it's already like, you know, it's like I recouped my investment from paying for Nansen, right? And so from here, I like to honestly just go to token flow and just take a look at all the different, uh, you know, tokens that people are investing in. These are ERC 20. So these are all Ethereum tokens as well. So that's, that is one thing to note, even though Ethereum is the dominant project. Um, so yeah, you can just take a look at all these and just look at how much people are investing. Why are they investing? And if you go a little bit further, for example, ADX, right? I don't know what that is. I click on it here. I can see that there's a smart money inflow of around $14,000. Not much, right? Um, we can see here that the price in the past seven days is up 4%. It's, it was deployed in 2020, so a little while ago now, but some of these older projects will still gain traction as well. If we can also take a look at the holdings, just take a look in the past, let's just say 24 hours, we can see that this person bought, looks like around $54,000 worth of this project as well, just recently. We can also do a little bit further analysis and click on that trader and see what they're holding. We can see they're holding Uni, Beam, USDT, Quant, API3, like other assets as well. We can also just take a look at some of their profitable trades that they've made, for example, Fun, PYR. And you can see that, you know, for example, on Fun, this trader made $130,000 and that's just in profit. So this trader is definitely one to note and has made some decent gains on some of these projects. And some of these I don't even know about, I haven't even heard of, they seem a little bit interesting. And this guy has a decent amount of holdings in a ton of different projects. We can also see when they're trading. We can also see the day of the week that they're predominantly trading on. We can also take a look at their charting view. So this trader is holding a million dollars worth of assets right now. Here, we can actually just see the overall charting view of all of their holdings, which one's growing the most over time. You can also do a couple of other cool things. For example, you can look at their NFTs that they're holding or you can also set an alert. So if I want to be alerted for when this person is transferring tokens to this address, or for example, if they're buying or selling any type of token, I can actually set up that notification here and I can send it straight to, to my Telegram, Discord, or even Slack, which is really cool. So for example, if this is a smart trader, they are consistently you know, making tons of profit on chain, then what I can do is follow what this person is doing. Because if this person, obviously this person is smarter than me, so I wanna know what they're doing and learn from them. So that's ultimately why I think Nansen is so cool and ultimately super powerful. Now, of course you can go the traditional route and go to a, you know, blockchain explorer. Like for example, Etherscan. Etherscan is a blockchain explorer for everything Ethereum. So ERC20 assets, you can do a bunch of due, due diligence and research on. And 
it's ultimately great, right? You can search addresses. For example, you can search a public address. You can search a token address. You can look at the code, for example, a specific project. Let's go into ENQ AI. So I'll just click on this and here we'll be brought to Etherscan. Let me get a drink here before I lose my voice again today because I got another hour or two of recording here. I say that in a fun way though. I'm having fun. If you guys are having fun, let me know. Now I'm going to go to, for example, the contract. And from here, similar match source code. So it's a similar source code of another project. It looks like, let me just click on that. And okay, that's interesting. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. That token was gamble. So that's also, that may be a bad thing. Um, here, it also just tells you a bunch of information on the code itself. And you can actually just click on, for example, contract source code solidity. And you can just, for example, copy this. And then you can just write like in ChatGPT, conduct an audit on this source code. And then I'll just paste it in there. And then another cool tool is Dex tools. And from here, what we can do is we can just go back into this ticker, the symbol, and we'll just copy to clipboard. And then we will just paste it right in here. And we'll just look at this. And we'll see here the Dex, the, the Dex tool score. We'll see some of the latest trades, which, which is pretty nice because we can see that there's a decent amount of um, buyers here, right? $5,000, $2,000, here. We can see that the contract apparently was verified. It was through an external audit. Uh, no to the honeypot scam. Uh, there is no buy or sell tax. That's also a good thing to note. So just taking a look at some of the data in here and just taking a look at this score is also something to note that could be beneficial to us. Another one to note is bubble maps. Here, you can also paste the address of this asset. And from here, we can just take a look at some of the top holdings. We can also see which wallets are connected. So for example, this wallet is holding 7% of the supply and it, they're also connected with multiple other wallets, which probably either means that this is the team and or this is maybe just one person, one whale, and that's a little bit cautionary to think about. But you can also do this with other assets and on other chains. So if you want, uh, Bubble Maps is a really good tool, of course, to use, which I will link in there's all these tools in the description below if you want to check them out. And so from here, again, you can just see that there's all these different addresses. And if you just click on any of these, you can see the size of them. So ultimately, this is a really cool tool where you can do a lot of due diligence. Now, the one thing about Bubble Maps is you do, I believe, have to pay for the latest updated information that's like of and current, because I believe the listings that it shows is not exactly current and it could be a few days delayed. So that's, that's, that is one thing to note with bubble maps. So again, that's another thing to note. And you can also just dive in to do a little bit of due diligence. For example, I copied and pasted that address over to Etherscan and you can just take a look at some of the holdings that they're using and using and, and they have here. And you can see some of their different spendings, like what are they actually using? How much do they have? For example, you can also paste this address into Nansen and get an easier view, which basically consolidates the information in a lot easier um, to, to manage and view type of way. If that makes sense. Am I making sense right now? I don't really know. And so, yeah, that's, that's another resource. And then another one, you can also use Lunar Crush, which goes over a lot of um, social sentiment, which again, I'm not super strong on because these can easily be botted. And so Lunar Crush is maybe one to look into if you want to get into the social sentiment side of different projects. Now, when it comes to tracking and looking at your portfolio, I would recommend either Coin Tracker. That's been one of my favorites. Ultimately, it's super easy to use. It's super straightforward. You just paste your address over and then you can take a look at uh, easy in an easy charting view of what your holdings are. So that's one one thing to note that I personally like. There's also Coinly. That's another one I really like, and it works very well. So um, these are really good as well for filing taxes as too. So I definitely recommend those. And so yeah, ultimately my favorite tool, the TLDR is Nansen. And you know, it's just super easy to use, super easy to look at. And if you really do a lot of due diligence and use it every single day, you get a lot better at it. So I highly recommend that you guys check that out. And of course I post in, I post all my analysis that I find from Nansen in the school group, which you can find in the description below. 
as well. So yeah, that's about it for this module. Stay tuned for the next. All right. Welcome to module 2.3. Today, we're going to be talking about tokenomics, why it's important, and also just the community as well, and why these are important. So first things first, let's take a look at Mint Layer and the, to the tokenomics of it. Now, the tokenomics when it comes to that is basically just the economic model that governs a cryptocurrency. And this includes the supply, the distribution, and also the rules that drive its usage and the value of it in the first place. Now, there's a couple of different factors to note. For example, there is the circulating supply, which basically just means these are you know, the amount of tokens or coins that are currently out circulating on the open market for anyone to buy or sell. And then there is the max supply of what will totally be out in the future, but it's not out currently. So you'll see the circulating supply on CMC and you'll see it in a very easy to read format. So for example, here you'll see 16% of the total supply is actually out and circulating. These numbers actually aren't fully correct because Again, this is a small project and ultimately you have to go to the website to get all the latest and greatest information. So here you'll actually see that there is going to be 600 million for the actual maximum supply. So in reality, there's actually going to be a lot more uh, tokens to eventually come out into supply. And so there's 200 million more actually when it comes to it. So this number is actually a bit smaller. So that's one thing to note. So ultimately with small projects, you, you do have to go to the website and take a look at it a little bit further. But here you can see all of the distribution plans. So this is in a really easy you know to, to read chart view. Here we can see there is the pre-seed sale. So these are the super early people, super early investors that got in. And you'll see that it's just under a percentage of everyone. These people got in at a super cheap price. Then you'll see the seed sale. So this was actually a pretty big chunk at 13%. And then you'll see that there's long vesting, that there's short vesting, there's marketing and listing. So basically this is for, you know, if the project wants to pay for, for example, you know, to have articles or news companies post about the project and, or if they want to pay for maybe influencers to talk about the project as well, that's another thing they could use this fund for. Uh, there's protocol development of, right? community incentives, team and advisors, and company reserve, which is the largest chunk here. So this is fairly normal with a project. Usually this is actually mostly the standard nowadays, actually. Now there is, for example, vesting periods, again, which basically means that, you know, they have to hold on to their supply and they don't have it liquid for them to be able to sell it until, you know, eventually time goes goes on, right? So here you'll, you, you basically just see all of the, you know, over time, how much people get over what supply. So that's one thing to note as well, that it's not like they get all of their supply per the token generation event, and then they can immediately sell. That's not the case. Now, so for example, this project Mint Layer has a maximum supply of 600 million. And another project that you may have heard about, obviously, is Bitcoin. And Bitcoin has a you know total max supply of 21 million coins that will ever come out into circulation. Now, currently it's 93.5% of those which are currently out circulating on the open market. But with that, there will be eventually 21 million that will come out into supply. And so for every project as well, you know, it there's years, for example, for, for these tokens to eventually be mined. For example, in the case of Bitcoin, I believe it's in 2140. And within that year, then the total supply should be all out and circulating by then. So I won't be alive by then. Cheers, guys. I'll be in the grave rotting, hopefully, or maybe, you know, ashes poured in the ocean. I don't know. Who knows? But at the same time, um, so for example, every single project has different amounts that will come out into supply at, you know, over a given time frame. So you have to read and do your own due diligence with that. Now, when it comes to, for example, Ethereum, Ethereum does not have a maximum supply actually. And so a lot of people think that this is bearish. And a lot of people think that because, because there is a infinite supply that will always come out, that it means that, you know, your supply will get diluted. And because of that, you know, you, the price point, there's going to have to be a lot more buyers to even just maintain the price. That's actually not correct because Ethereum has a deflationary type of mechanism. So when you use the, 
you know, use any type of ERC20 token or use Ethereum, right? You're in the Ethereum ecosystem. You have to use Ethereum to send transactions. And so doing that actually burns Ethereum. And so burning basically just means destroying the token essentially into a contract. And basically it just means destroying is, is what you need to know. And so here you can see that the supply chain just in the past seven days is negative 8,178 ETH. So actually there's been a reduction of 8,000 ETH in the total supply just in the past seven days. So that's one thing to note. And you can see this number here, there's 25,000 that have been burned in the past seven days. And then there's been 17,000 that have been issued and come out into supply. So along with that, ETH, as much as it kind of seems like on paper, it's bad because it has an infinite supply. At the same time, it's actually deflationary how that works. So every project is a little bit different and you ultimately have to do your own due diligence when it comes to that. Now, the ultimate, you know, one of the biggest reasons for a project to have a token or a coin oftentimes is the role of governance. And it allows people to basically vote on decisions that are made within the project. So that, that's one of the biggest uh, roles of a token usually. Of course, it's, you know, for example, in the case of Ethereum, if you want to send an asset, you know, within the ERC-20 space, you have to use Ethereum to do that. So that's one thing. Um, another thing as well is basically you're just kind of speculating on the price of that asset to go up. So a lot of people will obviously buy that asset and with the expectation that it's going to go up. So that's obviously one of the main reasons, right? I mean, at the end of the day, when people are you know injecting their capital into, for example, Doge or Shiba, I mean, do you really think they're trying to get engaged with the ecosystem or they really care about the true fundamentals of the project? No, I mean, it's a meme coin, right? And people, People know that at the end of the day. And so it's it's just like just for fun and it's just a thing. And so at the end of the day, that's the reason. Now, Doge also has a infinite supply as well. And so you have to read more about the tokenomics and how that works on their website. Now, I've actually seen some projects change their tokenomics over time. So you'll see occasionally, you know, on white papers that they say that there's going to be only a specific amount into supply over a specified period of time. When in reality, in the future, sometimes they actually change that. Maybe sometimes they reduce it. Maybe sometimes they increase that. That depends. So the project has the full control usually to do that, given the contract and the code. So that's also one thing to note is that sometimes projects do change that over time. So it's important to kind of monitor that. The other thing to note is that, you know, sometimes when it comes to, this is kind of just a little bit off topic, but I just want to talk about it anyway. So I actually brought up this project Myth the other day. And Myth is a interesting project. It's part of the gaming uh, type of, you know, space. Now, Myth on paper seems pretty good. It seems like a really great project in the gaming space. And yeah, there's a whole lot of things a part of it. So it's an interoperable token that's used in these decentralized efforts to provide anyone to participate in the ecosystem, et cetera, et cetera, mostly made for gaming. And so if you, for example, go to their Twitter, you'll actually see that there's only 4,000 followers and you'll see that their last posts have really been, you know, in October of 2023, right? This doesn't look good. And so when a project has absolutely no community, there's no one even really viewing these posts or liking them, that doesn't really bode well again. And so I just kind of wanted to reiterate this is that, for example, if you go to a project like Mintlayer, you'll see on their Twitter, you'll see that there is a full community, you'll see that they're posting often, and you'll see that people are really engaged within the ecosystem. And so that's a really bullish thing to note, at least. So it's oftentimes really good to see that a project is staying up to date with their socials and just the community developments as well. And sometimes you'll see here different changes to the tokenomics as well that the company wants to announce publicly. So that's all we have for this module. Welcome to module 3.1. Today, we're going to be talking about how to read and understand smart contract audits. So in this video, we're going to talk about what they are, how they work, why they're important, and where to find them, and just do a little bit of basic due diligence when it comes to this. So let's go over that. So we're going to get into a little bit of technical with this one. So first of all, smart contracts are self-executing contracts with the terms of the agreement directly written into code. 
So basically, they're really important in automating transactions and agreements in a trustless environment, such as, for example, blockchain platforms, right? So that's the whole point of them. Now, the code needs to be audited because people can make code that is nefarious or malicious in some ways that can do harm. For example, honeypot scam where people buy and are allowed to buy into a token, but they can't sell. This was the whole ordeal with the squid token that came about. People could buy into it, but they could not sell their tokens except the person who created it. So I wonder what happened to that guy, by the way. That was a that was a big whole scandal. And I, remember, I don't think they ever found out who the person was that created that. So uh, basically, there are audits with smart contracts. And these are pretty important to note when it comes to a project and really audits can be done through either security experts. Um, and what they do is they're trying to find vulnerabilities or bugs and other, you know, issues and things that could compromise the contract security performance or functionality. And there's different types. So there is through either manual code review by experts, there is automated scanning with software tools, and there's also formal verification processes. So for example, here you, for MintLayer, I'm just gonna keep using this because it's an easy example. Here you can see that there is a audit and that was done by Certic. You can also see when the audit was done per data on CMC. And if you just click on it, then you'll be brought to the uh, Certic page based off of this asset. So here we can see the mint layer ERC20 token and we can see the audit that was done on it. We can see that there was a code audit of the full code and the contract. We can also see that there was a KYC. So it means that they did KYC in a background of the team. It basically means that they have to upload photos of the team members. So upload, um, you know, their passport, say who they are, etc. And so if they can verify that on here, that's also a good thing to note. Here, you can just take a look at some of the different scores, governance, market, community, code. And overall, it looks really good. You can see that this is actually in the top percentile when it comes to audits over the entire uh, crypto space of audits that Certic has done as well. So that's also a really good thing to note. So, and you can just continue to read into here and see all of the different things that they've passed on in terms of the code and the governance and just do a lot of your own due diligence with that. So it's definitely one thing to note. Another thing you can do as well is just copy the actual code itself, the contract, right? Just right on here on CMC, just contract the, sorry, copy the contract and then go to a website called Token Sniffer and then you can just paste that in here. And here you can see the ETH version of it. And if you just paste that in, then you'll see the score. And here it's a 70 out of 100. And if you go to as to why, you'll see at least 95% of the liquidity is locked or burned for at least 15 days. So you can read a little bit more on that. Now, the other thing about this project as well, Midlayer, is that they're actually going to migrate to the mainnet. So it's not going to be on Ethereum in the future as well. So that's that's one thing to note. You can also go to another website called Dex Tools and just copy and paste the address over here. And again, look to see if there is a honeypot. So for example, that would mean again, that you could buy into it, but you wouldn't be allowed to sell. So malicious code and also buy and sell tax, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but you know, if it's greater than 5%, I would at least be a little bit cautious as to why, because you know, it's basically just going into the funds of the contract creator, right? So that's one thing to note. So, um, and then a couple of other things that we're, when we're talking about this is it's important to kind of figure out who made the audit. Some projects kind of boast about, you know, a project being audited and that it's clean and stuff like that. But if it was done in house, then obviously that's a little bit sketchy, right? And so if it's done by a, a famous company, for example, Certec is one of the biggest in the space, then that's a good thing to note. Now, at the end of the day, it's not the be all end all. It's not guaranteed, but it is a bullish thing to note. It is at least good for the project, but again, it is not a guarantee of that the project is completely safe. So at the end of the day, you have to do your own due diligence and just, you know, research more into it. So that's a little bit of the basics when it comes to audits on tokens and coins. Module 3.2, initial screening process, identifying potential. 
So first things first, I came across this project and I should, just want to show you guys like some of the initial stages of like what I would do to kind of look into a project, right? So this is super initial, just kind of bare bones, basic stuff that I would at least encourage, right? At least I would do. So for example, I came across this project, it's called OPSEC. And, you know, I saw that there was a decent amount of smart money flowing into it. And, you know, not much, actually quite, quite small, only a couple of holders, nine smart money holders, all holding around $200,000 worth of this token. So it kind of, you know, sparked my interest. And I was just looking into it and just, you know, at least seeing it, I also saw that it was just fairly recently deployed in January of 2024. So as of the time of me recording this, that, that that's fairly recent to me. But you know, it's a recent, re recently listed project is what I'm saying. Here, you can copy the address. And then you can go into, for example, CMC, and you can just paste the address, I would recommend copying and pasting the address and not typing in the name, because sometimes you can get brought up to another project that has the same ticker, let's just say. So it's important to paste the same address. That's one thing to note. Here, just taking a look at the bare bones basic, I see that first of all, these uh, little exclamation points and kind of like warning symbols basically means that it's not verified and it's self-reported market cap. So just to verify a little bit more and just do like some cross verification, I'm also gonna go to CoinGecko and paste in the same. And then I'm also going to open up Uniswap and I'm going to launch the application. This is on uniswap.org, by the way. And from here, I am just going to search in the token by pasting the address here. Let's take a look so we can see the TVL is $1.1 million. Uh, that's basically how much the project is holding, right? And we can take a look at some more stats here, more analytics. Let's just take a look. So we can see 24 hour volume is down quite a decent amount. That's one thing to note uh, fees. The project has generated within the past 24 hours, which is quite small. So if it says fees, that's probably because there's some type of buy or sell tax. One thing to note. So we'll look into that in the future. Uh, we can actually add liquidity if we want to this project. And we can also do it with a, for example, a token pair. And you can actually get, for example, a, a little yield on this if you actually dedicate your tokens to that. But that, that's another thing for another day, a full another course on that. Um, so here, yeah, just take a look, you know, TVL down a little bit. So, right, so fairly small of a project that we can basically see here. Um, so that's kind of just based off some initial screenings, just taking a look at price action on Uniswap, which is a bit more accurate than probably either CMC or Going gecko because it's brand new. We can see that the price is up 451% just in the past month. That's really good. It means that there has been some strong momentum into this project. So it's a AI and decentralized cloud computing unleashed. So elevate your decentralized applications with AI powered security innovations. So a couple of things to note, there are some narratives that are tickling my fancy, getting a little bullish tingles on this. Reason being is because as of right now, AI is kind of like the hot narrative. And so it's a part of the AI space and then cloud computing. So like render file coin, et cetera, in, in that whole space too. So that's another one, cloud computing. Um, and then also security. So you don't really see security popped up often either. So that's one thing to note. So it's kind of hitting the AI cloud computing and security. So it's hitting all of these factors all at once. Now, the market cap from what I can tell is fairly big. But one thing I do like at least is that the self circulating uh, self reporting supply is that they're already fully out and circulating. So that means as well is that there, you know, there isn't going to be inflation coming into this project um, at play, it's just buyers sellers. And it means that there isn't a third party of inflation diluting the price, right? So that, that's one thing to note, which goes against buyers if there is inflation, but that doesn't have that. It's just buy, sell, because the total supply is already out and circulating, at least per data from CMC. And that, again, that is self-reporting. At the same time, we can see that there is no audit either listed. So we're gonna copy this code, make sure it's copied again. 
and we're gonna go over to token sniffer. And then from here, we're gonna paste the address. We're also gonna go to Dex tools and paste the address here. And we'll do OPSEC WETH. Um, so just some of the initial things, we can see that there is a 99 score per uh, Dex tools, which is a good thing to note. We can see that the there is a buy and sell tax. Okay, so here we can see that there is 5% buy, 5% sell. That, that kind of sucks, right? So if you were to buy $100 worth as of right now, you would get actually $95 worth. And then if you were to immediately sell it, then you would get $90 worth. So that kind of sucks. And and then if you also add in the Ethereum gas fees, it also means that you're getting pretty railed if you're a small little shrimp on this project, if you're a small little fish, uh, sorry, shrimp. And so ultimately, if you're just going to be trading a few hundred dollars, I wouldn't be doing that with this project just because that ETH gas fees are going up and there is a buy and sell tax. So it basically means personally, I would only put, I would minimum put at least $500 into this project because then you could actually probably get something out of it, right? And so just taking a look at some of the trades, you know, I just kind of look briefly like what's happening. I can see that there are a lot more buys, just what I'm looking at here. We can also take a look at this. If we sort, we can see some of the large whales that are selling. We can see some of the large fish that are buying and some shrimp that are buying as well. These are basically just per size of their holdings. So that's one thing to note when it comes to that. If we just take a look at the token sniffer and just paste the address in here, we'll take a look and see, okay, token is pending review. So this project is that new that it's, it isn't audited. Uh, from what I can tell, it looks like Dex tools. There is check audits here. You can actually take a look at a couple of the things that I believe these are just software um, audits of this project. So overall, it looks pretty good on paper. Um, yeah, so overall, that seems to be pretty good. Um, you can also, if you wanted to see like developer activity, you can go to a website called Crypto Mizo, Crypto Mizu, Mizo, I think. And you can just either paste the address. This one probably will not be in here. And what it does is it basically aggregates the uh, GitHub activity. And for uh, comments, is it commits or comments? I think it's commits, commits. Yeah, commits, I wanna say. <laughs> I always say that wrong. And it basically just aggregates that information. And so if they can see on chain that, and sorry, not on chain, but you know, through GitHub that people are actually making an effort or developing a project, adding commits to the project, then that shows up here. And so you can see ICP is number one. Actually, there's the most amount of contributors and commits in general to this project. So, but this project, if I were to type in, for example, OPSEC in here, I can't see that. So that's, that is one thing to note. Now, um, just going back to, for example, CMC, actually on Gecko Terminal, we can see, this is through CoinGecko, we can see pretty much the same things from Dex tools. So we can just kind of, you know, cross-reference a little bit of, you know, information there. So it's, it's always good to cross-reference stuff based off, of, especially if the project is super small, right? So it's good to cross-reference. Now, let's take a little bit further of a look. We can see a little bit more. You can actually just read comments. Most of these are kind of spam or people have big bags of this project. So they're either trying to pump it or sell it uh, here. Take a look at this. Who the hell is the team behind this? Looks shady and unprofessional. Invest with caution. Um, could be FUD. If we take a look here, we can see that it's only really listed on decentralized exchanges, such as Uniswap. Moving a bit further, we can see their main mission, the main goal, right? That's that's super important to know. So the mission is to explore, implement, and guide the creation of secure, efficient, and decentralized digital ecosystem. OPSEC addresses limit, limitations in current infrastructure, aiming to foster a more democratic, resilient, and secure internet. So that's basically the main goal, main mission. That's important. Uh, here, if we just go to just initial check their Twitter, we can see that, okay, there's 12,000 followers. That's decent to note. I'm also just going to copy their 
um, their Twitter username based in my URL. I'm then gonna go to Social Blade. And from here, I'm gonna paste in the Twitter username and I'm just gonna see, are they gaining followers? And is it steady? Does it look organic? Does it look natural? Okay, here I can see that they're gaining, yeah, around 200, two, 300 followers a day. It looks fairly natural because the number is not just all the same. If we look at the chart too, we can also see that it, it looks natural, right? It's not just straight up one day and zero the next or negative the next, right? That would be looking fairly botted, which is easy, super easy to do as well. Now, going back to CMC, we can just click on the website and be brought to that main page so we can see what's happening here. We can take a look a little bit further. Overall, in my opinion, this looks really good. And I know the website is not the be all end all, but if it looks like your grandfather made it, then I personally don't really like to touch those. I like to touch the ones that at least look fairly futuristic or at least good on paper, right? And so I'm just clicking this, we can see roadmap, we can see the different things that they're planning, launching, etc. cetera. Um, I'm not really seeing much about the team. I'm gonna type in OPSEC team members crypto and here, OPSEC security post. I, I can't really find who the team members are. So that's one thing that is a bearish point, right? And so you kind of have to take all these tallies, right? There's, you know, there is a buy and sell tax, bearish point. There is no honeypot, bullish point, you know, decent tokenomics. They're fully circulating, right? Only buyers and sellers that are going to be in the mix. There's not going to be inflation and a dilution of, you know, inflation with the price, right? And so also good website. So you kind of have to tally up all of these different cons and pros all together and just make the decision based off of that yourself. And so overall, that's kind of the initial screening. You can also, again, go to the white paper per CMC and just take a look at what it says here. You can take a look at the abstract. So that's the problem that they're solving, the problem that they see in the space. And you can do a little bit more information and read more on this as well. And you can also take a look at when this was last modified and do a little bit more due diligence with that. So that's kind of like the initial screening of the project. And overall, in my opinion, this project looks good on paper to me, and it looks pretty small. Um, right now it's in the it's 61 million from the market cap, but with the uh, supply fully circulating, bullish, and with you know, being still being quite small, bullish, uh, hitting the couple of narratives and trends, AI, cloud computing, security, bullish as well. So I think it could play a role possibly in this market. And personally, I think the price could increase as well. So I like the project. So that's kind of just like the initial screenings of how I find the project and then what I do when I find it. Module 3.3, this one is super important, identifying red flags and avoiding scams. Super important, obviously. So today we're gonna to be talking about everything when it comes to scams. We're just gonna be looking at a couple of different examples of things I wouldn't really touch, me personally, of course. And yeah, let's just get into that. So first things first, obviously the crypto market is just full of scams. And because there is no centralized authority to protect anyone, it means that there is a lot more prevalent scams in the space, as sad as that sounds. So with that said, you gotta be super careful, okay? Now, first of all, let's just go over a couple of different scams. So there's phishing attempts. So there's scammers that use phishing emails or fake websites to basically trick you into revealing uh, your private keys or information. So for example, if you sign up to a specific exchange, Kraken, Coinbase, occasionally you may get an email. With this email, it could be from a person trying to represent the exchange, but it's actually not the exchange. And they're asking you to sign a transaction or do some KYC, upload your a photo of your ID and do some KYC or give us your phone number, okay? You just don't wanna do that, okay? So that that's one thing. And, you know, ultimately they're trying to get your information. They want you to sign a, a, a transaction, something like that. And just ultimately stay away from that. So when I get emails of, you know, people trying to pretend to be an exchange and they want me to click the link, don't do that. Um, yeah, ultimately, be careful when it comes to that. Now, 
Of course, there is pump and dump schemes as well. So there's projects that just, you know, go up and then ultimately the contract owners are just pulling the rug under everyone. This happens a lot in the space. That's old news. And you guys probably all know that. There's also fake ICOs. This is another prevalent one, which I've sadly heard in the community of other people investing in. Now, there are traditional ICOs and, you know, pre-sales that come about. And with these projects, you know, you have to make sure that you're going to the proper website. Sometimes, you know, there are websites that pretend to be an exchange or pretend to be a launch pad, a place of investment. And so with that, people actually sign transactions to invest with their money that they have. And then they accidentally sign a transaction, you know, of, of something that they shouldn't have and they get their wallet drained. So ultimately you wanna make sure you're going to the right website. Also, you wanna make sure you have multiple wallets. And we'll go over that in module five. We're gonna be talking about setting up a wallet and all of that and actually going through a full example of everything here. So ultimately stay tuned for that as well. So you wanna have at least a few different wallets and some that you can use for riskier things and some that you're doing for safer things. So we'll get into that later. And then also you wanna stay away from projects usually that have guaranteed returns, right? Or lack of transparency, but we'll get into that in a second. I, I wanna just take a pause here. Now, I actually posted this video a little while ago now, and here I actually talked about some of the trades that I saw with this specific project. And I saw on Nansen, all of the top trades of the day were actually just with one token, which was super weird to me and super strange. And usually that is not normal for a project to, you know, for to just see one token here being sold completely and just being, you know, just profits off of a lot of different people. And so I didn't really do much due diligence on the project at the time, but I actually just said in the video, like, I wouldn't touch this project. You know, I just see a ton of people that are, you know, selling it immediately, getting profit off of it. I've never heard of it. I didn't really know about it at the time. And this was actually through a launch pad. And I did a little bit more due diligence. You'll see here, the project was actually trading at $9 currently at that time. And then I was looking at bubble maps actually as well of just the, the token address and just taking a look at that. And I actually saw that there were a couple of super large wallets. Like there were some wallets holding 15% of the supply, 14% of the supply. And that looked super sketchy overall. So that's also why I didn't talk about that project in that video. Now, if we were to, for example, now go to CMC and just look up, uh, I believe the tickers, yeah, Satoshivam, Satoshivam, something like that. Yeah, this one we can see here, currently it's trading at $3.44. So the rug got pulled under a lot of people. This project was also heavily shilled on social media. So again, contrarian thought of you, you know, a lot of crypto influencers. We're talking about this project, peddling this project left, right, and center. Guys, I have a small YouTube channel. I have around 5,000 subscribers, I think, at the time of me recording this. And the amount of emails that I get from just shit projects emailing me of their shitty project and proposal is absolutely absurd. They also send me examples of influencers that they've paid to represent their project. And oftentimes, these are not who you would expect. And so, yeah, that that aspect that definitely saddens me with the space. So you have to be super cautious when you hear someone shilling a project and, you know, especially one that you haven't heard of before. So you can see here that the price of this one completely fell off the cliff. And the worst part about this was, is this project was also on Ape Terminal, which is a very reputable, you know, launch pad type of project. And here we can just take a look. We'll see right here. So you'll see all time high to ROI 286X and you'll see the total raise was 100,000. So in reality, that may be kind of true on paper. Maybe people got bought like super early, but at the same time, they could have been vested into the project for the next six months. So if the price doesn't go up, you know, above for a while in the next six months, they may be underwater with their initial investment. And also you, you can just see here the amount of just absolute selling at that point, right? So ultimately 
doesn't really look good, even though on paper it looks really good. The chart doesn't look good. It looks like there was just a ton of selling. You know, when I was taking a look at it on chain, there were so many people selling the project, which to me immediately says they don't believe in it. And or I also saw, I, I looked up a couple of different things on social media and I saw that there were a couple of big people that were involved in the project and they didn't really disclose it either. And they silenced people who said that they were involved in the project. So super sketchy stuff and just doing some quick due diligence on it. I would not touch that. So just my personal opinion. So ultimately it didn't look good in that case. Now there's other places like for example, on r slash crypto moonshots, you'll see people, you know, talking about these different projects and stuff. And you'll just see a hundred, 441 upvotes with two comments, super sketchy, super sketch, 500 upvotes, one comment, really? Really? I mean, let's just take a look at one pre-sale, pre-sale Harambe AI. Maybe this has potential. Who knows? It's also weird for 2 million members to be a part of this subreddit and then only 255 to be online. That looks super weird. I, you, you can't even look at the comments here. I mean, there is, there is literally no comments. It's just a bot comment. So I don't know if that's because the subreddit has closed comments for other people. Not fully sure. Um, so let's just take a look at, you know, Harambe token dot CC. Okay. Phantom leaves this website. Okay. Wow. This is interesting. So I have the wallet Phantom. Phantom is a wallet for, uh, Solana and it's, it's the prominent wallet for Solana. It's, it's really great. Absolutely clean website. And so they are literally giving you a flag that this website is a scam in the first place. So I'm actually just going to copy this link and then I'm just going to paste this into another browser. And so here, so immediately they want me to connect to wallet. Okay. Which is not necessarily a bad thing or a scam on paper, but it is a little bit annoying at least. Now here, one of the things they say on the website, or at least on this post as well, is it's, let's see, 30% more profitable than the market. So again, they're kind of guaranteeing returns here, a little bit sketchy, invest. So give us your money, hold, aka hodl, do not sell yours, we may sell on paper, and reap 100% annual. <laughs> That was a sneeze. Okay. We're keeping that in here. We're going raw. Okay. And reap 100% annual percentage yield. Okay. So that's like a guaranteed return. Now that looks super sketchy. There's also something called impermanent loss. This is basically when you're staking a token and you buy and invest in the token. Let's just say if it was at $10, you stake for a, let's just say 10 to 20% APY per year, but that price of that $10 of that initial value of the token decreases to like $2 at the end of the year. But at the end, of, but at that year, the end of the year, you have more tokens than what you initially invested in, which is cool, but actually on paper, the price of all of it went down. So you actually still lost money. That's one thing to be careful about is an impermanent loss when it comes to staking. I'm just trying to give you guys like knowledge just off the top of my head here with all the stuff that I see. So hopefully you guys like it now here, you know, it just looks super shitty. Um, yeah, not gonna lie. Like, you know, when you see all this stuff that's saying like guaranteed returns, Harambe, I know Harambe was funny and it was like the meme, but it just looks super sketchy. 30% of the presale is insane. 30% of the presale, absolutely insane. No tax, no team tokens. Well, I don't know. That's maybe they are holding. I like, I don't know. Question things, right? Just try to question everything that you see. Ultimately looks super sketchy. Um, I, I, you also beg the, it begs the question, like, why would you have to invest, right? Why would you have to invest into a project if, you know, if it's a meme coin, right? Why? Like what capital do they have to raise to what, what infrastructure do they have to build and, you know, create, right? So that's just something you have to ask yourself. Overall, it looks like a decent funnel of a website. It looks like they know what they're doing in terms of that. That's weird. If you click on this, it just pops up to the wallet. That's kind of odd. 
Um, you know, and you can do a little bit more research on this, but overall it kind of looks a little bit sketchy. You also see like here it says as seen in this. Um, if you see as seen in, you know, as seen in Forbes, guys, people pay Forbes to be listed on Forbes and look special. That's not, that's nothing new. Companies will pay, you know, for example, Crypto Daily, Bitcoin Insider, or like these different companies to be, you know, posted into a article. And then they can see as seen on, you know, this specific, you know, website or something. This, I just want to say, first of all, is probably bullshit though. And what I would, this is my initial thought with this project is that they are going to be listing it via the CMC news aggregator, which is going to be from another website, which will probably be a bullshit company. Let's click on it and take a look for ourselves. Okay, we literally can't click on it actually. So as seen in, so what even, so it's Harambe token. So if you just look up, Okay, so I found the link here, and it's not by CoinMarketCap. It's on CoinMarketCap's website because it's via the news aggregator. But if you actually take a look at it a little bit further, it's by Crypto Intelligence. Let's cr click on Crypto Intelligence here. We can see this account has only 165 followers. And let's go to CryptoIntelligence.co.uk. This looks like an absolute shit website. Um, looks like garbage, looks like something my, my grandfather could easily code in five seconds. Uh, yeah, just looks so bad. I mean, if we just take a look at what runs this website, let's, is this WordPress? It looks so bad, so bad. Um, it's definitely not something custom. It's probably just an easy copy paste template and let's just see. So, okay. I'm trying to see what runs on this website, but I, I can't really find it. Um, I don't really think it's popping up, but either way, it's they're not really running on anything notable or worth worthy. So yeah, ultimately something to stay away from is is that project. Would not touch it. Of course, that's just me, my own opinion. Now, the problem with projects is that people get married to them. People dive into them like cults. Now, cults can be a little bit good, a little bit bad, right? Obviously it's good to have a cult like following and you know People that love the project will do anything for it. But at the same time, when people are so married to a project and they, they're just saying, hodl, diamond hands, I get a little bit scared. Safe Moon was a prime example. You can look up YouTube videos, documentaries about it. Safe Moon was a project founded by this guy that you know created it, and he basically rugged most of the people, and then he filed for bankruptcy at the end of it. So super sketchy. A lot of people lost so much money. And ultimately it was because the, you know, the investors were so married to the goddamn project that, you know, look jo right here, five days ago, joined because scammed and hodl. Let's, let's read this. Well, men and women of the sub, this has been an absolute dumpster fire. It's pretty to watch. Last time I checked, it's caught up with the news. So they joined because they were scammed and they hodled and they stayed because they were watching the drama, right? So. Yeah, bought in early and never sold. So you'll often hear people say, never sell, it's going to go up to the moon and stuff like that. You got to be careful for that. And ultimately, you got to find an exit plan and, you know, a profit, a time to take profits. And we're going to talk about that in another module because that's for like a whole nother topic. Now, another thing too, of course, is to do cross analysis. And to do that, of course, is joining the Crypto Gems school group, the best group ever. And here you'll see a bunch of different analysis by people who are actually interested in the space and people that are not trying to scam you. That's the whole point of this group is to create a group of people who are actually interested in cross analysis, looking up interesting projects, small cap gems, on chain analysis, news and more. And other people will post things like, you know, for example, hey, guys, what are your thoughts on this token and this pre sale? What are your thoughts on this one or this new ERC 404 narrative that we talked about? So that's why it's also important to join a group. And of course, it doesn't have to be mine. But yeah, it actually has to be mine, which you can join, of course, in the link in the description below. But it's important to also be with like minded people who are all trying to win at the same time, right? So that's the point and purpose of this group. So um, yeah, ultimately, 
you need to be super skeptical before, you know, really getting involved into a project, just automatically at the forefront, be skeptical and don't fall for BS. Module four. And with this module, this is just going to be into one type of video. I know this is all conjoined into one, but module four is just 4.1. That's all we have. So we're going to be talking about theory stuff mostly, and just a couple things that I just want to talk upon. And ultimately you have to be the one to digest this information and make decisions yourself. So I got a new tea here. Luckily today I'm not losing my voice, which is nice. So I think I've been recording for like over an hour already, but I'm speaking a little bit quieter, I think. So that's kind of helping me here. First things first, building a balanced crypto portfolio. This is something you got to ask yourself right now. Do you think Bitcoin is going to 10, 50 X, right? Personally, I don't. And so that's why I've been leaning a little bit harder into smaller caps, which bleed a lot harder when it comes to the bear market, right? So when, when Bitcoin was trading, let's just see down here, I got to move my icon. Okay. When Bitcoin was trading at around like $17,000, you know, fairly recently in this bear market, right? A lot of these altcoins were just completely annihilated, absolutely dead. And so you know, they were also worse off and they had harder drawdowns than, for example, Bitcoin. And so when it comes to getting into bearish periods, obviously the larger caps, big caps are better to be invested in. But ultimately, it's better to just hold on to cash and then just finally to be able to enter the market and inject capital, you know, during this range. I'm super happy to this time, you know, they say that it takes two market cycles to actually make money in crypto. And you don't really find out why until you actually enter another market cycle. And I'm happy to really be, you know, have a strong position that was where I was able to inject capital in here. And it was because I, I have my own company. And so I was, you know, starting to stack cash during this whole phase here. And ultimately things seemed pretty bearish. So I kind of just sat on the sideline, held cash, waited to be able to finally actually have the cash and capital to inject it. And ultimately too, like, you know, scared money doesn't make money. So there is that mentality that I had. So, you know, a lot of people were really scared here. A lot of people as well, like a lot of analysts were saying that Bitcoin was going to be going down to $10,000. And it was like, when Bitcoin for me was below, you know, 20 and $30,000 for me, it was like, this is a no brainer type of, you know, opportunity for me at this point. And honestly, I saw the market was so bearish. There was absolutely, well, okay, I'm not going to say no activity, but there was really no activity in our slash cryptocurrency. A lot of people left. I was still making videos. I was still interested in the space. You can literally just go to my YouTube channel and find that for yourself. I was still making videos during the time when, you know, Bitcoin was absolutely demolished and everything else was as well. So ultimately, contrarian mindset is really good to have when it comes to the space. So yeah, I think, you know, while Bitcoin continues to rally and soon, hopefully, you know, can, you know, start battling it out with its previous all time high, you know, ultimately, I think it's important when, you know, prices are rallying, things look overbought, the market is talking about it, your grandma is talking about it at, you know, Thanksgiving dinner, this may be a time that, everything is a little bit overbought and maybe it's a time to start just stacking cash waiting to buy in lower, you know, at another time. I don't know. You know, this was also the same thing with ETH as well. So Ethereum went up to around 4,000, let's see, 4,600. And I'm happy to say that I was selling around 4,000 and I was able to get in at around 1,200 as well. It actually bounced down below a thousand. And I started buying again at around 1,200 when there was this support here at around 1,300. So I feel really good for that buy as well. And ultimately, it's super easy to get into the space when everything's rallying and to think that everything's going to just continue to go up and up when in reality, that's how you can easily get wrecked and also just not having any type of take profit plan. And so a lot of retail and dumb money will just get wrecked when prices start to sell and then they'll sell all the way at the bottom when everything's basically capitulated. And this is the best time to really buy in is when everyone's bearish. No one's really into crypto anymore. And honestly, for me as as you know, someone that has a YouTube channel in the space and actually can see metrics, it's actually kind of cool because 
when I saw that my views were at absolute lowest and no one was really interested in the space, that's when I was putting the most amount of my capital into it. And so that's paid off for me as well. So ultimately you need to have your own risk management in place. So there's a couple strategies with this. Like they often say, you know, people will often say, you know, an asset is going to 10 X 50 X, but then they get super quiet on it later on because no one really likes to talk about especially publicly selling, right? You have communities that are so bullish on a specific project when in reality, people are going to be taking profits behind the scenes. And so you don't want to be the last one holding the bag. So you can play, I, I, I strongly recommend to play around with different strategies, maybe think like, okay, maybe when the project, maybe when it two X's, maybe I can start to take X amount of money out of my initial investment, right? Maybe when it three X's, I will take this much out. Maybe when it four X's, I will take this much out. It's important to set goals and realistic expectations and to not be blinded by, you know, this like FOMO type of community that's saying hodl, hodl, you know, hold on forever. Don't sell diamond hands, that type of thing. So don't be blinded by that is all I'm trying to say. So one of the things is you need to cope with obviously the volatility. Like imagine this drawdown, okay? This is down 62% just in 67 days. It's just nothing but bleeding, okay? It's horrible. Or imagine this, like from here to here, 77%, right? From the all-time high to that bear right there, 77%, That that's horrible. And in order to cope with the psychological stress that comes with that is something that you really got to pre prepare for, buckle up with, is all I'm saying. So you need to cope with the volatility, cope with the FOMO and just like blinded communities of their, you know, they're basically like sports fans, right? They're just so blinded by their team, they'll do anything and die by them, right? But ultimately, at the end of the day, you need to be smarter, not married to your project, you know, set realistic goals, set take profit targets in zones, and actually get smart with this type of stuff. So also FUD is another one. So you'll see, for example, on like coin market cap, you'll see in the comment section, either someone um, either, you know, complaining about a project or being super bearish on a project. Take that with a grain of salt, along with the bullish comments as well. So just because you see a bearish comment doesn't mean that it's completely factional. And it also doesn't mean that that comment is true either. It could be wrong. So it's important to question things both ways as well. So yeah, FUD is also a big one. People want you to sell or or whatnot. You know, it could be bots online that you see. So that's also something to stay out, you know, and be due diligent uh, with. Again, entry and exit strategies. So you need to kind of say, okay, maybe when this project goes up X amount, I'm going, I'm going to sell X amount. When I get this profit of X amount, I'm going to sell X amount. So I'm not going to tell you what to do because obviously that's something that you have to decide, but you have to ask those questions to yourself. Now, the other thing when it comes to this, obviously, and we're going to talk about this in the next module, which we're going to get nitty, gr nitty gritty. Is that right? Nitty gritty. I don't know, but we're going to get down into the trenches. We're going to set up wallets. We're going to do some due diligence and also make a trade. So, so when it comes to security best practices, I just want to go over a couple things before we get actually down into the trenches. And these are just a couple things off the top of my head, but you need to do your own due diligence, of course. Now, when it comes to this, personally, when you set up a wallet, you need to s save the, you know, the private seed phrase, right? And you need to have that down either written on a piece of paper or actually ingrained into metal. Uh, so that's a little bit better than paper because then it won't be burned into a house fire type of event, right? Um, so that's one thing. Another thing, maybe even buying a safe, storing it in there, decent option. Another, then after that point, then you could maybe store it into a password manager, you know, like LastPass or there's others. And you can store maybe your private seed in there. You know, that would be probably an, an okay option. It's not the best. And then at that point, don't have it into your notes app. Don't have it in, you know, anywhere that's, you know, able for you to access it. Don't, don't store it there. So that's, that's also just a couple things to note. You know, off the top of the bat as well, just trying to think of a couple things. I don't keep any type of decentralized wallet on my phone, any 
software wallet on my phone at all. Um, personally, I don't because Vitalik Buterin himself even got SIM swapped, which is a type of attack where um, hackers are able to social engineer a hack with your phone provider and ask them for your information and they pretend you're you and then they give you all the information. Then they log into your phone and then they drain your wallet. And so I don't touch anything on my phone. I have the exchanges on my phone just in case, but ultimately I rarely sign into them. And then even if I do, I'm never using a decentralized exchange option and I'm never clicking on links in my emails. I'm never clicking on random websites or anything like that. I'm only going to either CoinMarketCap or Uniswap, especially on my phone. I'm not clicking on any type of link at all because you don't want to get fished. Okay, that's that's another thing to note. So I know some people don't have the option and luxury of having a computer and trading on their computer, but personally, I would at least recommend that more so over a phone because it's a lot easier to click on a link that you may not want to on your phone, for example. So that's, that's one thing to note. Another thing as well is not just getting a single cold storage wallet solution, like for example, a ledger, what I have here, but getting multiple. So for example, I have two here. I like this one because it's orange. So it kind of looks cool. It's like that Bitcoin orange, which is kind of cool. But I have two ledgers that I use for two different reasons, two different purposes. I also have a tangent card, and this is another cold storage wallet solution. With this, this application does only live on your phone as of right now, so it doesn't live on the computer. But this is a, a, another option as well. So if you want to have a phone option, then I'd probably at least recommend having a, the Tangem because, well, you can look into it, do your own due diligence. But yeah, you can sign transactions via the application and the NFC reader onto your phone with this card. So that's pretty cool. But I definitely recommend at least having a couple of different wallets along with that. I also recommend having a couple of different hot wallets and make sure that make sure that you're, you know, storing your private seed phrase, you know, securely and privately. So those are just a couple of things to note along with that. Just some security best practices. Of course, never tell anyone. And yeah, let's get into module five. Last module. This course has been pretty crazy for me to create long, longest video I've ever made in my life, uh, I think, total. So hopefully you guys like this. And yeah, let's dive into the trenches, actually get down into it. You know, I often think of exchanges in the crypto space as porta potties, right? There's a purpose and utility of them, but you don't want to stay in them too long, right? You want to get in, you want to get out, okay? That's how I treat exchanges in the crypto space, even the ones that I like. For example, I am a big fan of Kraken. I just happen to say that uh, I definitely really like it. Coinbase is pretty good as well. So these are kind of like my, my two favorite. But at the end of the day, you just kind of want to get in them, get out, and you don't want to stay in there too long, okay? Treat them like a porta potty basically is what I'm saying. Now, along with that, today we're going to be taking your training wheels off, setting up a wallet, and... The reason that, for example, there's there's a reason why you wouldn't want to do this. For example, if you just want to stay in the crypto space and just trade some of the big assets, ones that are vetted, properly listed on exchanges, by all means, then just stay on an exchange, right? There's no point to setting up a wallet, trying to copy you know, your secret phrase and you know trying to be safe and not get hacked and your wallet drained, right? At least with an exchange, you are safe to a degree. You have your training wheels on, right? So today we're going to be talking about, well, okay, sorry, let me, let me just back up a little bit on the other side of that. If you want to get into super small trades, like super small projects, they're not going to be listed on exchanges immediately. Okay. So usually by the time they're listed on exchanges, there could be a lot of selling pressure and, or there could be a ton of buying pressure as well. I mean, there is that obviously too, but at the same time, if you want to get into those, you know, the 50 X, the 100 X range, then that's going to be a little bit more difficult to do via an exchange. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I at least just set up like a, you know, have a couple of different wallets and stuff. Right. And so there are, I would say a couple of different wallets to sign up for. And for example, if you just go to Chrome extensions and you just look at the, so the web store, just type in the web store, you can look at, for example, 
MetaMask and get the MetaMask wallet. I also want to see if there is the Coinbase, there is the Coinbase wallet extension on here as well. So I'm just going to type in MetaMask and just get this and I'm just going to click add to Chrome. So that's what I'm using. It's one of my preferred browsers. And here we can see that it's loading up. And I'm also going to download Coinbase wallet extension. You can also uh, use Trust Wallet. Trust Wallet is really good for the Binance Smart Chain space. Um, that's also a decent one. So yeah, I'm just gonna click on Coinbase wallet extension and I'm just gonna click add to Chrome. So if you, you know, ultimately the reason why Coinbase has a, you know, has a wallet and why you see some exchanges have wallets is because they know the ethos of crypto at the end of the day is for people to have their, you know, their, their keys, not their keys, not their coins, so their keys off the exchange and to actually hold the funds. Because at the end of the day, if you have your funds on an exchange, it's really up to the exchange to do what they want with it because they're the ones that are holding your assets. So at the end of the day, if you want to be actually liable for what you're holding, then that's why you would use a wallet. And that's why some exchanges set up a wallet is because they still want you in the ecosystem. For example, Coinbase wants you in their ecosystem and their comfort of their UI, et cetera but they want you to be able to hold it because they want to be a part of the, you know, ethos of crypto. And at the, at the end of the day, you can connect your ledger to these two different wallets as well. So here you'd basically just click on create new wallet and you would make sure that you read all this information, click on agree if you want to. And then from here, you can just create any type of password. And let me just, make one right here. Of course, this is not a wallet that I'm going to be using, obviously, because it's just a sake. We're doing this for the sake of this tutorial, but I'm just going to create this paste, paste, agree, create new wallet. So there is a secret recovery uh, phrase as well. So um, you can set that up and then copy that, save that down, and you would save it either in a password manager, save it in a safe deposit box, uh, store it in multiple secret places. So that's that's what you would do if you would click this option, secure my wallet, which is recommended. Uh, for the sake of this tutorial, I'm not gonna do that, but do that and just follow the instructions, which are super easy to use. If you can't follow the instructions with this, you probably shouldn't be messing with this in the first place. But I highly recommend that you click that option and then write down all of the different random words. So I'm just going to click on this for now, though, and skip. Got it. Next. Done. Okay. Okay. All right. So from here, I'm just going to click on the extensions. I'm going to pin it to my extensions into Chrome, and then I'm going to go to CoinMarketCap. And from here, we can see that ETH is automatically added to my wallet. But for example, if I wanted to add USDT, I would go down to USDT here, and then I would go over to this, copy the address of USDT. If I wanted to add USDT to this, I would either paste it in here or add a custom. You could do either, right? Doesn't really matter here, but you could, I could just search USDT and because it's so popular, it would be here. But if, it, if, if this is a rarer type of project, then I would have to do the custom token there. So I'm just going to click on, uh, we'll click on custom and I'm going to paste the address next, next. Okay. Import. Now I have tether here. So all I have to do is if I add any type of ERC 20 compatible token to this wallet, then all I have to do is just copy this address. So, let me see if I can. So here is my my address for this wallet. Now, along with this, this is like my new my public address, um, and you can share this with people if you so choose. But at the end of the day, if they want to go to, for example, EtherScan or you know any type of on-chain analysis platform, and they want to, for example, look at this wallet, they can easily just search it, and they can see all your transactions, what you're doing on chain, etc. So. 
that is one thing to note. It is public and people can see it and they can't necessarily hack you, but they can't see what you're doing. So that's one thing to note before you like hand it out to everyone to share it to your friends or something. Now, let's just say you're logged into Coinbase. You click on my assets, right? And you want to either add, for example, any type of asset. So in this case, I'm gonna add USDC. So here, I'm just gonna click on add. And then let's just say if I wanted to add 100 USDC, I can do that right here and I'll just add it, click add, and let's see, get this to load for a second. Have a sip of tea. Order was executed. All right, I'm just gonna click on refresh. And from here, I can see that I have USDC. Now I'm gonna go back to my wallet address and we're actually not gonna do tether. We're gonna go back and add USDC here. Let me click on this and I'm going to copy the contract of USDC. So I'm going to add this into my MetaMask wallet and click on import token. I can either search this because it's so popular, USD coin, USDC, or I can just paste that address right there. I would more so recommend pasting the contract over. It's a little bit safer than just searching. So then I'm just going to click on import. Now from here, again, I would just copy my ETH address. So any ERC20 token is compatible to send over to this address. And from here, I can just easily click on this, copy it, and then I can go back over to Coinbase. And then I can just click on this and I can either click on send and receive. And from here, I can click on the max amount and I can click on this and then the network. So it could be Ethereum. And then I would just paste in the network address right there. And then I would just send it over directly to that wallet from there. Then you can go to, for example, a place such as Uniswap once you have your USDC and you can make a swap with it, which will go over in the next module. In my opinion, it's important to have a base of Ethereum, Tether, or USDC. Reason being is because most of these projects, right, most of the time I'm trading with ERC20 projects, and so usually they only have liquidity reserves with a pair such as USDC, Tether, or Ethereum. They usually don't have other pairs to trade into. Typically, I mean, most of the time they, they, they can, but oftentimes it, it's more important to have uh, Ethereum, Tether, or USDC. And then to be able to swap into the asset that you actually want, the low, small crypto gem from this, if that makes any sense. You can also add, for example, other networks. You can click on add and you can go to, for example, any of these, so BNB chain, Avalanche, Arbitrum 1, all of these. You can also add a network manually if you don't fully see it in here. But you would have to go to, for example, like you'd have to go to the website and paste in a couple of different information. So if you don't see the network that you want supported, you would just um, have to add it manually. So in this case, if I just wanted to quickly switch a network, like let's just say I wanted to add Arbitrum 1, I would just click on add approve here, I can see dismiss. And then from here, I would just click on Arbitrum one. So now I've switched to Arbitrum. So this is Ethereum on Arbitrum. Okay, so that is my Arbitrum ETH, right? Right here. So if I wanted to, for example, import USDC on, for example, Arbitrum, I would just go back here and I would go to, let's see, USDC. And then from here, I would hover over where it says more for the contracts. And I would go to let's see, where is Arbitrum? Let's find it. Arbitrum, Arbitrum, Arbitrum. Arbitrum Nova, no. Let's see, Pulse Chain, no. Base, no. Did I pass it? Ah, I did pass it. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this. I can also just click on this to easily add it to MetaMask, but I'm just going to copy this. And then I'll go back into MetaMask, paste in the address, and then it'll add it into, for example, this wallet. Also, if I didn't know how to bridge from Ethereum to Arbitrum and I wanted to search that up, I would just look up, for example, um, Arbitrum Bridge. 
and I would make sure I'm on the proper website after doing some due diligence. I would agree to terms. I would connect my MetaMask wallet, and then I could bridge funds over from, for example, Ethereum to Arbitrum and get them there in a fully decentralized way. So yeah, just a couple things to note. I just kind of wanted to say a couple of different things here. Um, another thing, so let's pin Coinbase and have that right here. So again, let me just put it on, wait, I'll make this uh, here. All right, so Coinbase. So looks super smooth for the UI. I really like that. Create new wallet. And then here is the secret phrase. So you can copy and then paste this down. And I'll just do this for the sake of this tutorial. So boom, make sure you have that saved, continue. And then you saved it right, and then you have to put the first and the twelfth word. So it's tone. Of course, I'm not going to use this wallet. And the last one is first. Submit. Now we're going to just enter a random password here. Enter a random password. Agree. Submit. Boom. So now we have a wallet set up. Now, again, with this, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, we can actually just transfer. Uh, looks like add crypto with Coinbase Pay. Oh, so it looks like you can just bridge easily over to Coinbase. And let's see. Add crypto. Transfer from another wallet. Ethereum address. Okay, so you can just copy your Ethereum address and you'll see all the compatible different things. So for example, like USDC on Ethereum network, I'll paste that here and I can just copy and then it'll automatically add it once I send it over to this wallet, okay? So super easy. It's also cool because you can, there's a bridge function kind of built into the wallet. Again, there's send and receive, so super easy. And then from here, when we go to a website such as Uniswap, which um, one of the safest ways to actually get to Uniswap and not click on some type of scam website would be to one, have ad blocker on your computer. So you're not going to click on some scam stuff, right? And then at the same time, you would just click on, for example, the asset. So Uniswap is one of the most popular DEXs. It's one of my favorites that I like to use. I would just click on the website link, uniswap.org. Oops, wrong one. Uniswap.org here. Okay, Uniswap. So it's literally just uniswap.org. Launch the decentralized application. And then from here, I would just click on connect. And I would connect either my MetaMask or my Coinbase wallet. Super easy to do. And I'll just connect this account right here. Click on next. And from here, I would be able to swap my asset that I have. So for example, USDC, USDT, etc. So I'm going to send money over to a wallet right now and actually make a trade. And we're going to find a project. I'm going to add it to my wallet. And then I will literally just put money into it and just make a trade right here right now and we'll get into it let's go welcome to module 5.2 so this is going to be the last part of this entire course so in this video we're going to be actually going onto an on-chain analysis platform doing some research due diligence finding a project adding the contract address to our wallet and then placing a trade with the funds that i just sent over so i sent 100 uh, usdc and that has since changed to i believe around 92 USDC because of the ETH gas fees, which kind of suck. So that's also one reason to trade on another network. But for the most part, a lot of projects are using Ethereum. So that's why I mostly choose it. So we're going to go over to Nansen.ai. I'm also going to check out the group, of course, Crypto Gems, and just seeing what other people are talking about right now. We're talking about this narrative. So ERC 404. So the biggest one right now is Pandora. And it's a couple other things, Defrogs, this is also another project. And then there's one that I actually saw, which was JPEG. So these are a couple of projects that we're taking a look at today. Now, if we just launch Nansen, take a look, we can see where there are smart traders uh, taking profits and which, which tickers they are taking profits on. So in QAI, virtual, these people are taking profits on those. Uh, let's see, bird. So I'm just going to take a look a little bit further here. So Pandora, this is getting a ton of capital, right? Just in the past seven days, the price is up 
50%. It's going into this ERC-404 narrative. Going a little bit further, ITP, APE, C98, Synthetics, Injective, IOZ, Deployed 2021, IOZ, I, I don't know the sticker, IOZ Network. Let's take a look. So we can see, let's see, oh, okay. Oh, all right. So it's like, if you take a look at the past year, it's up 500%. If you take a look at the all time, it's still down 87%. So the tokenomics, let's take a look. So looks like there is a ton into supply, possibly infinite supply, just kind of off the bat is listed on Coinbase. That's very good. Prominent exchange. KuCoin, decent. Uh, Bybit, decent. Now, when it comes to what this project is about, ah, uh, okay. So it's about DPIN, Web3, AI, storage, and streaming. So that's that's pretty good. Um, you know, it's hitting upon a couple, of, a lot of narratives right now that are fairly hot, right? AI, storage, streaming. This is pretty good. So website looks super clean. Uh, just doing a little bit of research into this looks fairly good on paper. The only thing to note is that obviously like the, the current price doesn't look amazing. Now, you know, right? Like you don't necessarily want to, in my opinion, like I wouldn't want to all of a sudden take a look at this and think, okay, I'm, I'm now going to buy in when really I could be the last one holding the bag. People could be taking profits, et cetera. But at the same time, the price is rallying a decent amount. All right, I'm sorry, guys, but my camera actually just shut off, so I have to start here. But let's just say, you know, we're bullish on AIOZ, right? We think it's an interesting project, and, you know, we think we're bullish on it, et cetera. We did our due diligence. We, you know, came across it and saw that it was interesting. We looked at the team, looked at the Twitter, you know, looked at the tokenomics, and also just looked at the narrative in general and got bullish on it. What do we do here if we wanted to, for example, trade it? Well, we would go back to CoinMarketCap and then we would copy the contract, the address. We'll just copy it here. And then we would go into uniswap.org, lose my voice here still. And then we would just sign in. We would do this by connecting. And then we would do that either through MetaMask or Coinbase wallet or whichever other wallet that we had signed up to. And then from here, we would click on select token. And then you probably won't see it anywhere in the popular tokens, more than likely. And from there, after you copy the address, the Ethereum contract over from CoinMarketCap, then we would go here and click on paste. And from here, we'll see AIOZ network. And if we wanted to, for example, swap it from our USDC, we can do that here. Or if we had Ethereum that we wanted to swap it into, we could do that here, or USDT, etc. You can do that right here. And then from there, all you gotta do is just connect wallet and then make the trade and swap. The only problem is right now is that gas fees are quite high. And so I don't want to make a trade with just $93, around $93 um, as of what it is right now, just because of the fees. And you know, you make the trade and you have to pay sometimes $20 or more in Ethereum gas fees. And, you know, that's obviously a problem. So I wouldn't really recommend to make a trade with less than $100, especially. Um, honestly, my personal rule is usually don't make a, don't, don't make a trade um, under $500 is typically what I would do. Just because if you have to pay the gas fees, you at least, you know, want to make that, you know, you want to make the transaction worth it really. And so if you're going to be paying high gas fees anyways, then, you know, you might as well at least do $500, right? That's kind of my personal rule, obviously. But, you know, this is also a good reason why you should stay on an exchange actually sometimes where, you know, the gap, if the gas fees are so low on exchanges and, you know, they don't, you know, charge you for gas fees, or if they do, it's very little, then that's one reason to stay on an exchange. So anyways, guys, that's all I have for this entire course. I hope you liked it. My voice is absolutely shot right now. 
I've had to drink five teas doing this. But if you guys like the content, then do me a favor by going to the link in the description below and joining the school group. And there you'll find a community of other like-minded individuals looking to find smaller cap gems where we all share our analysis and I post there, it, you know, I try to post there at least once a day, sometimes just, you know, five to six days a week there. And I post my analysis, projects I'm looking at, news, other things like that, small topics, things like that. So if you want to get engaged and join the community, make sure you do that by following the first link in the description below. Anyways, guys, that's all I got for this. My name's Trevor, also known as Minted Max. See you guys later.